Okay. I'm really hoping that this is working. Oh no, I need to sneeze. We're like 10 seconds in and I already need to sneeze. Hello. Good evening. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I need to sneeze so bad. Hello, hello, hello. Oh my goodness. I'm actually, well, I'm mostly on time. Okay, I'm mostly on time. I was like one minute late because I forgot to turn off the big light. That doesn't count. Technically, I'm on time for once. <laughs> that doesn't, however, mean that there won't be technical issues because there's almost always a technical issue during my stream. So fingers crossed we can go as long as we can without having like a really big technical problem. So, hello, hello, hello. Let's have a look. Who have we got here? Ba -ba -da -ba -da. Germany, ooh, Germany. Louisiana, Oregon, Italy, Austria, Belgium, Florida. So many people from so many places. Colorado, Iowa, New York City, very cool. Florida, Texas. Is it, is it, is, wow, words. It is, Ar is it Arkansas? Arkan, I can never say it. <laughs> I'm terrible at pronunciation. Argentina, Canadian living in England. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. Boring old England here. Ah, oh, that's all right. We're in the same place then. So that's it. And that's not too bad. Romania, North Carolina, Northern Ireland. Hello. Hello, hello, hello. Oh, Massachusetts. Detroit, Kansas. Okay. So many people from so many places. I don't think you can even see my, I've got like a pile of tissues next to me because I'm having really bad allergies. <laughs> so if I sound all sniffly, it's because I'm having an allergic reaction to my coat. Seems a bit silly, but I wore a coat around a cat and now I'm allergic to my coat <laughs> because I'm allergic to cats. The jug of water is here and I'll put it back down before I break it because today is one of them days where I'm tripping over and I'm dropping everything. Arkansas, Arkan, okay, Arkansas. Okay, I got it. I'm terrible at it because I see a word and I'm like, should I just say that phonetically? And it is almost never right, like ever. The music, random music is starting really early today, as we can see. So, thank you for joining me for the, what number is that, uh, 33rd live stream. Oh my goodness, 33. I remember when I started doing these <laughs> and it doesn't feel like that long ago. The 33rd monthly live stream. And I was a bit uncertain as to whether or not I was gonna do this today because it's obviously the 22nd and I didn't know whether people would like not come to a live stream if it was this close to Christmas. I don't know, but we're here anyway. We're just gonna have to see how it goes. If we're not as busy as usual, that's all right. Cause people, you know, have stuff that they need to do. But yes, another day, another live stream. Same as always, rules are the same in that I answer questions chronologically. I respond to messages chronologically. So if you've posted a comment and it's right at the bottom of the list and I haven't got to you yet, I won't be able to read it. So I'm just gonna have to go through chronologically. So please don't like spam repeat comments because if I haven't reached the first one, I won't have reached any of the others yet either. And it will just annoy everyone else in the chat. Please be nice, please be kind, don't be rude. I'm not gonna answer every single question because I get a lot and that would take up way too much time. So if I have already answered the question before, I have a full video on it or I simply don't wanna answer it, I might not answer it. But I do, as many of you know, try to answer as many questions as humanly possible, which is usually quite a lot. <laughs> so yes. Eleanor, oh my goodness, so many people. So I've got this one here. This is just in the middle. When did you start practicing? I started actively practicing. Um, would it be like July or August? Ish, about 16 years ago. About. I have, I've got to that point now where I'm kind of losing track of like the years. <laughs> and it's getting to the point where I keep forgetting. So now I just say, over a decade because it makes me feel less panicky about the fact that it's been that long. <laughs> do, 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 do. 
Uh, let's have a look. God, I've been modding for almost three years. You have learned. <laughs> You've been modding for so long. You are one of my first ever mods, if not my first ever mod. And thank you so much for still sticking with me three years later. It has been a really long time. It doesn't feel like a long time though. It feels like I did the first live stream like last month. And then I remember what my setup was like and I was like on a dining room table just in a magnolia coloured room with orange hair. I will never go back to orange hair ever again. That is, I'm done with orange hair. <laughs> no, no shade to anyone who likes like toxic waste coloured orange hair, but that is something I will never do again. <laughs> right. It feels like it's been so long since I did a live stream, but I don't think it actually has been. I think it's only been about three and a half weeks. What song is playing in your head right now? I don't actually have like any song in my head. It's just kind of a random assortment of bits of different songs. So like I've got some Good For You in my head and then I have some Thunderstruck in my head and then I have just a collection of like other random bits. So I feel a little bit like, you know those ghost hunting devices where they like, they go through different like AM radio frequencies and they make this like random noise? That's what my brain feels like, just with random bits of song. These are monthly? Yes, these are always monthly. Or at least I try to do the monthly. I don't think I've ever... I mean, I might have missed one, but I tend to try and do them the Wednesday after the 15th of the month. Which sounds really confusing, but it's because the mystery box goes out on the 15th, and I can't have like four hours of my day missing before the mystery box goes out, so I have to do it after the mystery box. That probably makes no sense unless you've been here long enough to know about the mystery box. <laughs> what do you think about the trend where you throw lucifers into a bowl of water and when they touch you are hexed? When they don't you'll find lucifers. Am I missing something? What are lucifers? I've seen the thing where they throw matches in. Is this autocorrect? Has your autocorrect screwed you? I'm not quite sure. You'll have to let me know. I've seen it where people throw matches into a bowl of water and depending on where they touch and if they touch, it is said to determine certain things. The problem I have with that style of divination is that it's incredibly dependent on the things around you. You just have to be breathing heavily or you just have to live in an area that isn't entirely flat you just have to touch the bowl or even the water consistency, whether you have really hot water, really cold water, whether it's hard water or soft water, it's gonna change how the matches react to one another. So it's a very old thing where you would say, put a, um, a match or a stick on top of the water and use it as dousing. And then there's a form of divination where it's where the sticks touch and how they interact that determines the outcome. And I think it can be good in some cases. However, there's a lot of videos that I've seen, primarily from TikTok, and no shade to TikTok, that do very obviously show someone interacting with it to get the response that they're after, which I think makes it then difficult for you to, to do it effectively at home if you've never seen it done in a way that doesn't have any kind of external interactions. I don't know if that makes any sense. It's a valid form of divination. However, it's so easy to trick it into doing what you want it to do that it kind of becomes a not so useful form of divination, if that makes sense. Whereas there's other techniques out there that I would recommend much more for checking if you've been cursed or if you have any kind of negative energy surrounding you that are much harder to force in a certain direction. It's a bit like pendulums. If you want an answer out of a pendulum, then you're more likely gonna get that answer because you're almost forcing your body to create the micro movements. It's kind of a similar situation to that, but you'll have to let me know if Lucifer's was meant to be matches. <laughs> Cause I've seen it done with matches, but I'm not entirely sure what Lucifer's are besides the fact that, ah, Lucifer's is Dutch for matches. Ah, thank you so much. Okay, that makes sense then. We're referring to the matches thing, yes. That's really cool. Lucifer's is Dutch for That is the cool as hell word. Lucifer's is Dutch for That's amazing. Sorry, that's like blown my mind. I had no idea that that was what that meant. Okay. 
We're learning new things together today. We're learning new things. Right. I've got to scroll back up again now. Scroll back up, scroll back up. Here we go. Do you celebrate the winter solstice? I, I did celebrate it, kind of. I don't really do like massive celebrations. Honestly, this time of year is so stressful. I can't even relax to really enjoy it. But yesterday we went to a outside light show thing. It's a charity event where everyone's like outside and you like watch these stories be like projected onto buildings. And it was really, really nice. So I did that. And then when I got in, I sat and I read and I did some more illustrations for merch. And then I read some more. And then before I knew it, it was five in the morning and I figured, you know what, I probably should go to sleep. <laughs> and that's how I celebrated my winter solstice. Um, I don't really have any like hard and fast things that I do for any of the Sabbaths. I really just go with it. And this year has been so manic that a light show and reading was really all I could manage. And you know what? I'm fine with that. <laughs> I'm fine with that. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Morrigan? I don't really have any intense thoughts. I have never worked with her and I've never connected with her. So I don't really have any intense thoughts other than the mythology is really stinking cool. Do you lose faith in your abilities even after this much time? Is it normal, do you think? Oh, completely it's normal. 100% is it normal. I don't think I've spoken to a single person who hasn't at some point doubted themselves. And I've doubted myself many, many times over the years. It's just that ultimately it ends up balancing itself out for me. So I think everyone is gonna go through these phases where they have that self-doubt, whether it's because something hasn't worked or they haven't experienced something the right way or that they've simply fallen out of their practice a little bit. It's completely normal. It, it doesn't mean that you shouldn't be doing it anymore. Sometimes it just means that you need a break or you need a bit of a refresh and you need to be going into something different for a while and then come back to it again. Sometimes it just means that you need to try a different technique to get the success out of that working. So I wouldn't get too discouraged from it. It really is completely normal. And it happens to me all of the time. Not so much at the minute, but definitely in the past, it, it definitely has. And I mean, anything can shake you up a little bit in your practice. So definitely normal. Do you do tarot readings for other people? No, um, mainly because I barely have time to do tarot readings for myself. <laughs> I used to do readings for people, um, now I don't, just because it's so time consuming and I want to be able to give people the readings that they deserve to get instead of having to be rushed and panicked and getting it done super fast. So I don't do any readings anymore because I just, I just don't have the time. What piece of media do you think shows magic as close to accurate as possible? Oh, that's really interesting. Um, <laughs> I, I don't think anything shows it particularly accurately. So if, if we're talking like, are we talking media like social media or media like TV movies? If we're thinking social media, then anything that's more long form, you're gonna have better luck with. So things like, YouTube blog posts, like actual proper like long written blog posts, you can get a lot of great information out of. Short form media, the problem is, is that you're very limited with what you can share. So you don't get the full breadth of the practice in it. If we're talking like TV shows, movies, books, and that's not um, non-fiction, if we're talking like fiction, I'll be honest, the best media source in fiction that has real magical practice in it is comic books. If anyone has read Constantine, anything with Constantine in it has a lot of real practice that's embedded in the universe. For whatever reason, comics are just particularly good at getting actual real life involved in them. I don't know why, they're just really, really good. So yeah. Of the two, long form media, comic books, somehow really, really good. As soon as you get to movies, you lose me a little bit because they're always just really overdone, like every time. I've got the hiccups again. Right, I'm gonna scroll back up again now. I always get hiccups, every live stream. Do, 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 do. 
What does your daily practice look like? It looks like me barely holding it together. That's what it looks like. I don't really have an intense daily practice. I don't really have any daily practice because I don't need to. It's fine if, if you have a daily practice and if other people have a daily practice. I don't have the time to be doing that shit every day. Um, I just don't. So I will do like a tarot reading or an oracle reading maybe like once a month, maybe. And then I'll do spell work and ritual when I need to do spell work and ritual. Otherwise, I don't see the point in doing it. You know, if I don't really need something, I'm not going to ask my spirits and I'm not going to waste my energy on something that I just don't need. And then I will do energy sensing on just a daily basis. But that's not something that I manually do. That's just become this automatic part of my life now. And I think you just get to the point where it does just become like breathing. It's just this automatic thing when you can tell what's around you because you're constantly sensing the energy. And that's really the only thing I do daily is that the way I perceive the world is different because of what I practice. And so even if I don't do spell work and ritual every single day, my worldly perception is different because of what I know and because of what I do. And I think that's really the main daily practice that I have because I don't have the time or the patience or the willpower to be doing like rituals and meditations every single day. I'm just, I don't have time for it. And I think a lot of people can maybe feel that in their own lives. Cause I mean, if you've got kids and if you've got pets and if you've got like to care for people, that's like a whole thing in itself that takes so much time. And then you've got like a full-time job and it just becomes this whole thing where you just feel like you never have time. So I think a lot of people probably feel like that. So if you don't have a daily practice, you don't need one. Just make sure that you're doing what you're able to when you're able to. Like, if you don't feel like you have the energy for it, don't push yourself so far that you're spreading yourself so thin that nothing you do is good anymore, you know? Just make sure that you're keeping your energy where it needs to be so you're not just draining yourself all the time. Oh, thank you so, so much. Thank you so much. Oh, I'm in Incufish? Incufish. I'm hoping that's the name. Thank you so, so much. Creepy or not, but I use your longer videos to fall asleep since I love your voice. You know what? I wouldn't even necessarily call that creepy. I do that with people all the time. There's like certain YouTube channels where I just think their voice or their content is so soothing that I fall asleep to it all the time. Have you read Before You Cast a Spell? I have. Yeah, it was actually one of the first books I started recommending on this channel a very long time ago and uh what are your thoughts on it i'm thinking of giving it as a gift for a beginner which i've only read part of it but read mixed reviews yeah the thing is is you're always going to get mixed reviews especially on a book that is written by an author like carl mccollman because carl mccollman actually converted back to a christian tradition a lot of people have essentially said well since he's christian now i'm not going to trust anything he said in the past which one I think it's a really small minded way of perceiving the world because like people's religions can change. I think it's a really small, small minded perspective to have. The book itself contains a lot of really good information. It's important to note that Karl McCollman was originally a member of the Wiccan tradition. And so the book itself contains some aspects of the Wiccan tradition within it. So it's just important to note that beforehand. But the actual practical content of the book of learning about basic beginner practices I really enjoyed. Some people don't like his approach. They think that he's very condescending. I don't think he's condescending. I just don't think he coddles people. See, my, my one of my things I hate the most in a book is when the book like coddles you. It's like, oh, it's okay, it's fine. I just, I can't be dealing with being coddled in a book. Carl McCormick doesn't coddle. You know, if you're acting like an idiot, he's gonna tell you you're acting like an idiot. If you're doing something wrong, he's gonna tell you that you're doing it wrong. So I really enjoyed the book, but obviously I can see it for what it is. You know, it does contain aspects of Wicca in it and it's a very straight to the point book. But of all of the older practitioners I've had the pleasure of being taught by, every single one of them is recommended Before You Cast a Spell by Colm McCullman, which is why I read it. And I did find it incredibly useful. Is it the best beginner book out there? No, I do have a beginner book video that does talk about some of my favorite beginner books that aren't Wiccan based, um, but it's still a decent book for what it is. Does witchcraft run through your family like from generation to generation? No, and 
99.9999% of witches you will ever meet will also not have like 15 generations of witches. Because it just, it, it's not really how it works. I mean, witchcraft is a practice, it's an art, it's a skill. And although, for instance, if you were learning the guitar, if your dad knew the guitar and his dad knew the guitar, it's kind of something that's been ingrained within your life, even growing up, but you can't just play the guitar. Like you aren't born with the ability to just play the guitar. You still have to learn it, even if previous generations in your family have been a part of it. So I've met a lot of people who like to say that they are like a 50th generation witch. And I'm like, how do you even know? Like, how do you actually know? Because it's really hard to trace even basic genealogy, but to then trace, like, the things your family did 700 years ago, that's pretty hard to do. So no, I don't have any known practitioners within my family, but then it's important to remember that up until the 1950s in England, it was actually illegal to practice witchcraft. So you wouldn't really advertise that you were doing it, even if you did, you would just keep it to yourself. So it's generally just really hard to know, especially in areas where it is illegal or it has been illegal up until recent years. It makes it very difficult to track it because people were really secretive with it. Oh, I forgot to breathe for all of that. How can I do spells, but I don't know how to give my energy for stuff? learn how to work your energy. There's, there really is no shortcuts. Like it, it's not like a, well, you can use this instead. To be very proficient at spell work, I would always recommend being proficient at energy work. Now, of course, there are other options. I have a full video on how to power spells that includes ways of doing it that don't require working your own energy, but they're still gonna require energy from somewhere. So you can work with deities, you can work with spirits for energy, but please remember you do have to give them something in return. They aren't just gonna give you something for nothing. You can power spells through items and objects, through stones and through the earth, but ultimately you are gonna need to know how to work with that energy, otherwise you might get it, but then you're not able to re release it from yourself. So if you don't yet know how to work your energy, I would always recommend doing that as one of the first things you learn because it's so, so useful later on when you do want to develop into more advanced practices. Oh, I really need to learn how to breathe because I can't breathe properly out my nose today because I'm allergic to my, my jacket. I, uh... I've already answered this question. The good doctor, I think I've answered this three streams in a row. Can you include not magic into knitting and crocheting? I've, I have answered this three different streams in a row. There's so many different options for this. There's actually a book specifically about crocheting magic. And I can't remember what it's called. If anyone knows, please let me know in the chat. But it's specifically a book about knitting and cross, what's it called, uh, crocheting that includes magical practice in it. There's lots of practitioners out there that do it, um, and there's whole books on it out there that you can find. But yeah, I think in the last stream, someone actually found the name of the book and put it in the chat, but obviously I know the streams are like four hours long. But yeah, hopefully someone will know the book that I'm referring to. I personally don't crochet or knit, so I don't have the book to name it. But I know that there is someone I follow who's got the book and they said that it was really good. So it could be worth trying to find it and see if that helps. Do you read palms? I don't read palms, mainly because I don't like social interaction with people. <laughs> and I feel like, yes, you can read palms like on the internet, but I feel like there's something different about reading palms in person versus reading palms online. And I don't like interacting with people in person. <laughs> So I don't read palms, unfortunately, but hopefully you will be able to find an answer to your question from someone who does. Because obviously, I'm not going to give you a nonsense bullshit answer if, if I don't know the answer to it. What's an egg cleanse? Okay, so egg cleanses aren't traditional, as far as I know, to British witchcraft. So what I know, I only know from my friends who do practice other styles of practice. I think it's very common in 
Italian witchcraft, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly. Essentially, from what I've gathered, and I would recommend asking this same question to someone where this is included in their practice, because obviously traditional witchcraft doesn't include this style of cleansing, is that the egg, I believe, acts as a scapegoat, like a, a vessel. So as you put the egg around you, it's in your energetic field, or it's physically touching you, the eggshell, it then absorbs the negative energy from you into the egg, which can then be disposed of. That's as far as I know. I think it acts as a scapegoat to draw out that negative unwanted energy or unwanted attachments into the egg, which can then be dealt with separately. But I would thoroughly recommend checking that with someone who has it as part of their practice, because I don't know anything much more about it firsthand. Tips on dream work. Ooh, yes. Do you have any experience working in the dream realm or astral? Both. It's a very, very large topic. So is there anything in particular you would like me to talk about in that aspect? <laughs> ah, fiber magic. Sorry, that was loud. Fiber magic. It's already been noted. Behind, look at you all fast and everything. Do, 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 do. What's a good substitute for sandalwood? What are you using it for? It's really the only thing I can say in response to that because what you substitute a plant for is going to entirely depend on what it is that you're using it for. And so I could recommend a general substitution for sandalwood, but it might not work in certain instances because it's going to entirely depend on what it is that you're after. What was the last book? Wait, what was the last book you picked up? Ah, okay. It's actually kind of difficult for me to answer that one because I got uh, quite a few. I might have made the bad decision to go to a charity shop and I might have bought a few books. I might have also got some from the Witchcraft Museum in Boss Castle. So the last books I got are actually next to me because I have a pile of books. This bookshelf is full, right? The only spaces are just like in this bottom section and those books I'm currently reading. So I have like a mountain of books next to me and I've got nowhere to put them. But the books that I got most recently were, um, oh, I actually can't show you one of them because it's in my vintage cupboard. But my most recent ones are Walking the Tides, Seasonal Magic Rhythms and Lore from Nigel G. Pearson. Pearson? Pearson. This gentleman also wrote, I think it was a deed without a name, I'm not sure. One of the other traditional witchcraft books that I've read is Nigel G. Pearson. It might be a deed without a name, but unfortunately I can't see the name on the side of the book. But I got this one from the Witchcraft Museum, and this one looks really interesting. If you want a really good publisher to go through if you are interested in traditional witchcraft books, Troy Books. <laughs> On this side, Troy Books <laughs> is so good. They do the some of the best releases in, <laughs> in traditional witchcraft books. I can't believe I was pointing at the freaking barcode. Um, they publish some of the best traditional witchcraft books that you can find. I love Troy Books. I have almost everything that they've ever published. And then I got Spellbook of the Good Witch of Pendle, Reliable Magic for Success and Circumstance by Joyce Froome. This is a really, really tiny book. I was really excited to get this. This is essentially a collection of um, traditional British charms that were found, essentially. Whoa, it's signed. What the? F it's signed. I haven't even opened this yet. I only got this like two days ago. Um, it's essentially a selection of folk charms that have been found. And duh, I just love this kind of stuff. So I got this also from the Witchcraft Museum, though I'm thoroughly excited about the fact that it's freaking signed what the fuck i didn't know that and then i got two books from the charity shop i typically only get books from the charity shop that are either out of well no i get a lot of books from the charity shop but if they're out of print i will 100 percent get them 
or if they're vintage. So I got two. I got one that is a 19, 1920s first edition clairvoyance and crystal gazing, I think is what it's called. It's in my, it's in my like protective cabinet that I have for all of those super vintage ones. And then I finally managed to get my hands on this. This is Call of the Horned Piper by Nigel Aldcroft Jackson. And this has been out of print for years and I've been after it for years. And did it cost me a pretty penny? Yes, it did. But every other edition that I found of this online has been like a hundred pounds. And I think this was 60. Is that a ridiculous amount of money to spend on a book? Yes, of course it is. But then I have to keep reminding myself that books are my business. Education is what I do. Therefore, I justified it. Should I have justified it? No, probably not. But this is another one of those books where I have been told time and time and time again that I need to read it. Could I get it in this country? Not at all. So if you can find this and you can get it at a reasonable price, it's a good quality. I mean, I got this one because it's basically new. Um, I would recommend giving it a go because I've been recommended this so, so many times by very experienced practitioners. So I decided to give it a go and holy shit. Oh my goodness. Nanette, thank you so much. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. Oh my God, I'm gonna cry. Virtual hug, because <laughs> I don't know what else to do. Thank you so much. That means so much to me. Oh my, oh my goodness, I'm not gonna cry. I'm not gonna cry. I might cry, it's fine. I'm not gonna cry. I'm good. <laughs> I'm a cancer. I wear my heart on my sleeve. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna scroll up again. Holy shit. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go up to where I was before I actually burst into tears. Where was I? <laughs> oh, what is? Oh, I this question actually came. This one is, what is a rare book that you still want to find? And actually, this one was the rare book that I have been after for a very long time. I don't think it's actually that rare. It's just really hard to find because I don't think it's still in print anymore. Let me see, when was this one printed? This one was printed in 1994. And as far as I'm aware, this one isn't in print anymore. So I was so excited to get this. There's a few other books floating around. I I should have taken it. I should have taken it. I went into a secondhand antique bookstore that's local and um, the guy there is obsessed with occultism and he showed me, he showed me a book and it was a coven book of shadows from the 1960s and 70s and only like 10 copies of it were ever made and he had one of those copies and I didn't get it. Why? I don't know. I don't know what possessed me. I left with like a hundred pounds worth of other books and I didn't get this like exceptionally rare book and I'm still kicking myself and I can't go back till after Christmas because now he's closed and I just have to hope that he's still there when I managed to go back again because <laughs> I should have got it and I'm so annoyed at myself that I didn't get the book. <sighs> Do you believe, it's <laughs> a complete change of topic here. Do you believe every plant has a spirit attached to it? I, mm, it's an interesting one. So I follow a relatively animist style tradition. Now I, I don't necessarily believe that every plant has a spirit attached to it, as you would say, perceive a spirit of someone who's died or a fairy. I don't necessarily perceive it as being that kind of spirit, but I believe that every plant has an energy that is unique to it, that we can then draw on or ask assistance from, depending on how well we've interacted with that plant and its species, you know? So that's really where I go. I know that there's some traditions that do believe that there's a, a spirit within every single plant. For me, it's a it's a unique type of energy that's gonna be different for every plant you interact with. And it, it then explains to me why if someone gives me 
like two leaves and my eyes are closed, I can tell which one is which plant because to me every plant of a certain species feels the same way. I don't mean like to touch, I mean like energy wise. You can do it with crystals as well. I've often found that I can tell what the crystal is based on the energy. So if someone were to just give me two different crystals, if I felt the energy before, then I can recognize what the crystal is without ever looking at the crystal. So for me, it just kind of lines up in that way with the things I've already experienced. And that's typically how I, um, how I perceive it. I know some people believe it's just energy. Some people don't believe it's anything. Some people believe that it's spirits. I think it's gonna very much depend on the practitioner. Do you have a Christian relative who has been a problem? No, nope, never. Um, never ever actually. I don't really have anyone in my family who's got a problem with it, mainly because they know me as a person and they know that I'm not just gonna, I'm not just gonna do something stupid. <laughs> I'm like not that kind of person at all. I'm the kind of paranoid, I will check every alternative option first kind of a person. So when they learned about the witchcraft, they were just asking me questions at Christmas. Like we were just like chilling and they were just like asking me questions. <laughs> Cause I didn't tell anyone until they found my YouTube channel. And then they found out that way, which was probably very awkward. What do you think is the worst book you've ever read? Oh, that's a really good question. Okay, I'm not gonna give any names, mainly because I don't wanna get sued. And believe it or not, people do get sued for giving negative book reviews sometimes. Um, I've read two books in the last year that were <laughs> beyond atrocious. I mean like so unbelievably bad. One of them I read, it's an exceptionally popular book and uh, the book basically says that if you don't have female genitalia, you're not allowed to be part of the practice. And they use very crude turns of phrase to describe the feeling of womanhood. And I'm like, oh my God, what is this shit? And I did get all the way through the book. I forced myself through it so I never had to look at it ever again. And it was awful, I put it down. It's currently sitting in the relegation pile in my living room of books that I feel like I should burn. <laughs> and I don't like burning books, but that is the kind of thing I would do with that book. And then there's another book that I read that's specifically aimed at people who want to do baneful magic. You know, people who want to curse and want to hex and want to learn about it. And the title says exactly that. You know, it, it's about cursing and all this stuff. And then the first page inside the book, it says that anyone who does curses and hexes is an evil person and is going against the Wiccan read and that you therefore shouldn't do it. And then proceeds to spend the rest of the book talking about positive magic. And I'm like, I'm so confused. I am so confused. It genuinely feels like there was like a mix up in the factory of like which book cover should go on which book. And to this day, I'm still confused. I am still confused. I still don't entirely know what happened there. I have it somewhere. It's gonna go in the burn pile as well because that one was awful. Like actually awful. When you immediately know what book it is. Yeah, see, I'm not, I'm not gonna say any names. I'm not naming any names, but if you know, you know. And this is why I would always recommend looking at the book reviews. Now, do remember, of course, that everyone's opinion on a book is gonna be different. But when you have enough people saying that a book is turf, um, I would say just avoid it, because some of these are just like, Ooh, <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not gonna read that again. <laughs> so yeah, there's a few books that I read that I just don't like. They'll never, they usually never end up on here. <laughs> I have like books everywhere and, um, and they will usually never end up on the bookshelf if I really, really don't like them. Usually. Right, I'm gonna scroll back up again. I wanted to see if, if, any, if anyone uh, knew what I was referring to. <laughs> Which probably wasn't a good idea. I try, I don't do neg, I, hmm, I don't do entirely negative book reviews. I actually just, I'm just gonna put this in here because it's on a similar vein while I'm looking for where I was. Um, I had someone ask in my quarterly book breakdown why I don't do negative reviews, because in the video it sounded like I didn't give a negative review. I didn't like one of the books in that video, but when it comes to the books that I review in that way, unless it's a book that's so unbelievably bad, 
I will usually always talk about it in a way that's like, this is why I didn't like it, but some people might like it because of this. <laughs> so sometimes the books that I review that I really, really didn't like, for instance, Hedge Witchcraft in that video, I, I didn't really like it at all personally, because it, it wasn't what I wanted out of that book. It doesn't mean that that book's gonna be terrible for everyone. I just didn't, didn't particularly like it. So in the video, it sounded like I liked every single book, but it was just because I was being civil with the books I didn't like. If there's books that I think are absolutely horrific to the point where I don't even think they deserve attention, I will never name that book. I will never talk about it because even bad press is press for that book. So, that's why I didn't name any of the really, really bad books in that video because I just didn't want to give them any airtime with like names and stuff because it just wasn't worth it. Do, 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 do. Where was I? I think I was about. I was here. If you create a magical circle with salt, do you still need to put the energy behind it or does the salt itself work? Both. It all depends on what you're using a circle for. I think a lot of people don't really know the different ways you might want to use a circle, but there's kind of two main ways. So casting a circle acts as spiritual protection. So it limits the amount of interaction you can have with spirits that are going to negatively impact that spell work, who are going to disrupt that spell work, and it also blocks any external energies that are gonna influence the working. So a salt circle, in this instance would work to assist in blocking negative energies. However, of course, please remember, don't put salt outside because you will destroy the earth. Not a good idea. However, the other way that you might want to use a circle is to contain that energy. The idea being that you build up all of this energy within that circle and you build it and you build it and you build it so that you can then release it all in one go. Now this has kind of twofold purpose. The first is if you're using that energy and you want to funnel it into an object, you don't want any of it leaving the circle because then you don't have access to it anymore. So you will build up all this energy and then you'll force it into an object all in one go, like a piece of jewelry or a battery, for instance, those kind of things. Or you build and build and build that energy so that when you drop the circle, you release that energy all in one go, which is believed to have a stronger result. And I found it has a stronger result than like drip feeding that energy. Now, salt circles are only gonna work for protection. They're not gonna contain the energy that you have created. Not really. So it really depends on what you need that circle for. I really need to learn how to breathe when I'm speaking. <laughs> You'd think I would know by now. How do you know that your incense smoke is safe to inhale? I got a stick incense for my best and a, and a friend of mine said it's as bad as smoking. It's not as bad as smoking. Um, breathing in any kind of smoke isn't great for you. Like let's, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, it's not. However, I think there's a big, big difference to burning incense in a well-ventilated space versus sucking toxic fumes through your lungs, like, directly. Do you know what I mean? Like, big difference. Always burn incense in a well-ventilated space. If you have any breathing conditions at all, I would not recommend burning incense. If you have pets, small children, breathing problems, you don't need it. There's lots of other things that you can use to represent the air element, to represent different intentions that you can add into that space. But of course, everything in moderation. You know what I mean? Like the world isn't zero or 100%, it's the 99% in between. And as long as you're being careful with what you're doing and you're making sure that you're not burning incense every waking minute of every day, I think you're probably gonna be fine as long as you don't have pre-existing health conditions that are going to make it more hazardous. And that, that applies to everything, you know? Paraffin candles are not as good for you as beeswax candles are because they are essentially plastic. But burning a paraffin candle isn't gonna do you huge amounts of harm unless you're burning one every second of every day and you never leave the vicinity, you know what I mean? So it's just about making sure that you're being careful, making sure that you're being safe, and then just making sure you're in a well-ventilated space. I think it's meant to say on the back of incense packets, it should be burned in a well-ventilated space. And I would always recommend doing that. Don't trap yourself in a room with an incense stick. It's much better to have like a window open a crack or even just fully open so that you can get the fragrance of that incense without 
getting, you know, all of the smoke up your nose. How do you deal with guilt attached to not having the energy and motivation to actively practice? This is an interesting one because I think I've I've got to the point where I no longer have guilt because I don't care anymore. <laughs> I think you, you probably will just get to that point where you're like, screw it, I don't have the energy, I'm gonna go sleep for five hours. Um, at the very start, I felt really bad about it because I felt like I had to do like a, a ritual every single day. I had to do stuff all of the time and I just didn't have the mental capacity to do that. Like my brain just did not allow me to do that. And I think the more I've fallen into my practice, the more I've been doing it, the less I care. <laughs> because there's there's little things that I can do to like ease me towards what I need to do that doesn't involve, you know, a full-blown ritual. There's definitely tools that you can use, tools that you can work with that can really assist in minimizing the amount of energy that, that you need to put into active practice, which is really useful. And generally, I just get to the point where I don't care. And this is why I would say, if you follow a lot of practitioners on Instagram, it could be worth just muting them for a while if you are finding that you feel very guilty. Because I have found especially TikTok and Instagram can be really bad for making you feel bad as a practitioner. Because especially Instagram, we're seeing like aesthetic photos all of the time. And the same people are posting like dozens of photos a week about all the different rituals and workings that they're doing. And the reality is, is that that's their job. It's not a standard practice that say you or I would have. Their job is to take photos of ritual and post it on social media. And I find that a lot of the time when you see people doing that, you shouldn't try to match yourself to that because that's not realistic if you have a job and a family and you have all this other stuff going on, doing as much as people do online isn't realistic. And that's why I'm never gonna sugarcoat it on here and say, yeah, I do daily practice every single day because the reality is I don't. And I think most other practitioners don't. And I've actually met a lot of far older practitioners than me who've been doing it since the, you know, the 60s who say that they don't have a daily practice, they don't practice that often. And I think it's mainly a social media thing that's giving people this impression that you need to be, you need to be doing stuff every single day to be a valid practitioner when you really don't need to be. And I know that that kind of detoured from the topic we were on, but that's just a, a, a note for anyone who's listening to this. Cause I know that a lot of us will, will be on YouTube and we'll be on Instagram and we'll be on Tumblr and Facebook and we'll be bouncing around all those social media sites, social media, in every sector, not just beauty, not just fitness, in every sector is fake. <laughs> it always has been, it always will be. And we can't be comparing our magical practice to the people who are literally getting paid by Instagram and sponsors to talk and post photos about witchcraft. Because like, it's not, it's not something attainable for every single person. Oh, thank you so, so much. Oh, li little, is it Little Led Drew? Little Led Drew. I don't know where to put the space in that. I, I'm really sorry, but thank you so, so much. I really appreciate it. Is celebrating the eight Sabbaths considered Wiccan? Because I remember aren't all of them actually actual pagan holidays from Celtic cultures way before Wicca was made popular? So yeah, um, the Sabbaths are from different traditions. So you have four primary Celtic festivals. These are the fire festivals. So um, Beltane, Samhain, my brain cannot function. Oh my goodness. Anyway, there's four fire festivals that are from Celtic calendars. And then there's other festivals that are from Germanic traditions. And they've kind of been together by Gerald Gardner who kind of created the wheel of the year as we see it today. So it's one of the main reasons why I primarily focus on the fire festivals because my tradition is more of a Celtic tradition rather than a Germanic tradition, whereas other people will focus more on the Germanic holidays rather than the Celtic holidays because that's more of the tradition that they follow. So it very much has been smushed together. All of the Sabbaths have historically existed before Wicca. And some of them are so, so old and they've just been altered and changed. Not a huge amount. They've obviously been changed to fit within the Wiccan wheel of the year system, 
but a lot of the original characteristics are still there to a degree. So I would definitely recommend looking more into the individual festivals themselves because there's a rich lore that goes much, much deeper than what we see today in the Wiccan tradition. But obviously it's not just Wiccans that celebrate these festivals, I should note that here. There's lots of traditional celebrations that still occur in the local regions where they took place in originally, and there's lots of pagans and non-Wiccan followers of the um, holidays as well. Some will pick and choose, others will do all of them, some will just do a few of them. Do, 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 do. Do, 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 do. Are you familiar with the works of Damien Eccles? Damien Eccles, Damien Eccles, that name is so familiar to me. Was he one of the Memphis Three? Damien Eccles, Damien Eccles. I believe I've got a book in my wish list. I have like a, I have like an Amazon wish list that I put everything in and then when I fancy getting a new book, I'll go to like book depository and I'll get the book. And I believe I have one of, well, I ha is it called Higher Magic? And he's standing like this on the cover. I don't know. I feel like I'm imagining things now. Maybe I just made that up. I'm not sure. Um, but I, I haven't read any of their work yet. I'm gonna have to um, have to read it and see if it is the book I'm thinking of. I, I think it is. Watch this all just be like one big mandala effect and it's not actually that book. Do you work with pendulums? I do work with pendulums, yeah. Have you ever worked with Hecate? No, I only work with Bridget, Keridwen and Keronos. I don't work with anyone outside of that. I have a little bit of experience with Nyx and Poseidon, but not a huge amount. Um, I've never really had a calling to any other deity outside of my kind of main three. Um, so no experience with Hecate, but kind of intimidating. A little bit intimidating, yes. Is it normal that I'm fine with explaining witchcraft to my friends, but I feel like I sound crazy when I explain it to my parents? No, that is com completely normal. Completely normal. It's, it very much depends on how you would interact with them. I mean, your friends are more likely to accept anything that you would do or want to do, whereas parents are often, you, you want to prove that what you're doing is justified, so you feel really awkward when you're doing it. So I completely get it. I get this a lot with family. With family, I'm way more awkward explaining it to than everyone else. I think that's just something that happens. How do you approach folk magic when it has a lot of Christian ideals, such as dogmas, demons, angels, Christian prayers, etc.? Not many people wrote about folk magic. So here's the thing, right? Folk magic is Christianized. There's no way around it. It's a fact. Folk magic is the magic that was practiced historically by the people of a particular area. That's folk magic. And so, although historically, the magic that was practiced was non-Christian because Christianity hadn't come to be in that area yet, as Christianity began to sweep across different parts of the world, we see Christian aspects being added into pre-existing folk traditions and that then ultimately becomes the folk tradition because it's what the people practiced in that area at that time. And you can see it in the documentation as it sweeps across the British Isles. You start seeing that more and more written charms have Christian aspects in them, whether that is um, aspects of text, whether that's psalms, whether that's um, written petitions for God rather than to an individual, say, water spirit, it's become God. And, and it's just part and parcel of folk magic. There, there's no real getting around it. So a good example for this is this. This is The Black Toad by Gemma Gary. So Gemma Gary is a really well-known um, folk magic, traditional witchcraft author. And the reality is, is that you can't avoid the fact that there's Christianity in it. So for instance, let me find one in here. Let's see if I can find one that's good. Here we go, here we go. So this is a charm that was found in Exmoor for healing cattle and it ends, God the Son and God the Holy Ghost, Amen. And this prob charm probably comes from about the 1600s and the thing is is that it's just something you have to accept. You get to that point where you just need to. Folk magic isn't folk magic if you take the the religious belief of the person who did it out of the equation. 
So like I can work folk magic by adapting folkloric beliefs and charms and items to suit my own practice in the modern day. So it's just a case of adapting what there is left. Because unfortunately we do see, especially when it became illegal to practice the arts in whatever form it might be described as during that time, you start seeing that the only way that it survives is by incorporating aspects of the accepted religion into it. So really, we should be thankful that there's Christianity added into folk magic, because if there wasn't any Christianity added into folk magic, we probably would have no record of it at all. Because it's only the fact that things were done in the name of the Christian God that we even still see written documentation of it happening at all. Because although the church wasn't super accepting of it, they were far more accepting of it if you stuck, you know, amen at the end of it. You know, they, they were far more willing to let it slide if it had more Christian aspects in it during a time when it was very taboo to do anything outside of it. So it's a really interesting topic in itself. And I mean, some of the some of the most prolific authors on uh, folk magic will include a lot of Christian folk magic into it because you kind of can't avoid it. I need to learn to breathe. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> right, where are we? Are there any protections that I can put on mirrors? Yes, yes, of course. Um, so the term that's typically now used to describe it is sealing, to seal a mirror, is to stop things from crossing between. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, the basic idea is that mirrors are liminal places. Liminal places are the in-betweens. And at liminal spaces, you can access spirit realms and spirits can come and go much easier than at non-liminal spaces. So mirrors are considered a liminal space, and actually in many cultures and religions to this day, it's believed to be incredibly bad luck to put two mirrors facing one another, because if two mirrors are facing one another, they believe it creates a portal to and from spiritual realms. Now, I've never had a problem with mirrors, actually, until last week. Interesting that this comes up now. And I use very simplistic um, protection sigils, and I will actually draw it onto the mirror. Simple as that. Now, I'll be honest, I used a hairspray to do it because I didn't have anything else and it was four o'clock in the morning. You can use an oil, you can use moon water, you can use any kind of protection oil, works well for it, but obviously protection oil is gonna get sticky over time, whereas something like moon water won't. You can use particular blends, you can put herbs behind mirrors, there's lots of things you can do. I'll have to do a full video on how to protect and seal mirrors, if that's something that you're interested in, using my techniques for doing it. But for me, my most common technique is to put a sigil on a mirror. <laughs> because it's the thing I've done the most frequently for both myself and other people. I haven't actually had to do it here until last week. And then you should have seen me, I'm just standing there, it's four o'clock in the morning, I'm exhausted just spraying like heat protectant and hairspray into my hands so I can draw it on the mirror. <laughs> like an absolute nut job. But it's okay, it worked, it was four o'clock in the morning, I did what I had to do and now it's sorted. But yeah, really interesting topic in itself, lots of options there that you can use. I don't understand how kitchen witchcraft can manifest. Okay, that's a very specific very specific one. It manifests in basically the same way as everything else manifests. So in kitchen witchcraft, you are imbuing energy into the food and the drink that you are creating. This food and drink then contains the energy which you consume or someone else consumes, you know, if they know what's happening. So for instance, if you are doing a a soup or something for good luck. So you're, you're mixing up this soup and you're charging it with your energy, you're charging it with your intention, you then consume that soup. The energy then becomes a part of your energetic field, which then affects the astral, which trickles over into your physical life. So it's really no different than doing anything else. If you were to wear a, for instance, an, an amulet, for whatever reason you might be choosing to do that, whatever is up to you. So you then wear that, which then affects your energetic field, which then begins to affect the physical world around you. So essentially, we are working on an energetic level, which over time trickles over into the physical plane. And the 
that that idea happens with every type of practice like whether it's kitchen witchcraft or whether it's elemental practice or whatever it might be it's just that in kitchen witchcraft you are consuming it you are consuming that energy rather than releasing it to trickle into the physical plane i hope that makes sense i'm finding explanations today just, just so difficult oh my goodness relic of ages holy shit thank you so so much Oh my goodness, that's amazing. W would you rather be a phoenix or a unicorn? Oh, interesting. Phoenix. Phoenix is just so cool. I'd rather be a phoenix. I think so. I don't know. I'll leave it up to you. What, what would you guys rather be? Would you rather be a unicorn or would you rather be a phoenix? I think I'd rather be a phoenix. I think phoenix... Phoenix is... Phoenix I. Phoenix? Is, is the plural of phoenix just phoenix? I've opened a whole kettle of fish now. I'm not going to be able to stop thinking about that now. But thank you so so much relic of ages it it really really means so much to me thank you oh my goodness you guys are freaking amazing what are you reading at the moment oh interesting okay at the moment i am reading a book called oh libra sigillum I, th I, I can't remember the author, but it's called Libra Sigillum of Those Who Wander. And it's a book all about, it's a combination of ceremonial magic, planetary magic, and alchemy. And it focuses on working with the cosmic energies of the planetary bodies. And I haven't got far enough, I haven't got like super way in, I'm about, I'm about quarter of the way through. And so far, it's the only book I've read in the last two years that has made me put the book down, get my book of shadows and write in my book of shadows. That rarely ever happens because most books that I read, I've heard the information before like 20 times. So like to find a book that has so, so much good information in it about that style of magic that I've never heard written in such an easy to comprehend way. It's so concise that I love it. I love it. And it's going to be in my next quarterly book breakdown. And I'm so excited about it. I do have to keep reading it though, because I need to finish it. But I've been so busy that I just haven't read any more of it. But so far, really good. If you're interested in that kind of ceremonial, planetary, alchemical style of practice, really good. Just be warned that it is intense. Like from the second you start reading, it is full on. There is no like gentle easing. Nope, nope. You've got to be like focused from the minute you read that first word. And um, if you are on Kindle Unlimited, you can get the book on Kindle Unlimited as part of your Kindle Unlimited subscription. I got the book when I was in Glastonbury before I realized it was on Kindle Unlimited, but it is a really, really good book. Thoroughly recommend a read if that's the kind of thing that you like. I don't know where I was going with that. I was going somewhere with it and then I just completely forgot. <laughs> right. No, but it, but but but. Trying to figure out where I was. Can spell work change the weather? Um, that's a really interesting one. Um, it's a very highly debated topic. It's a little bit of a taboo topic within the witchcraft community because you have the people who are like, yes. I can change the weather. And then you've got other people that are like, no, you really can't. And I find that it's very much somewhere a little bit in between. It's important to remember that weather systems are exactly that, they're systems. And what causes the weather is a whole collection of interconnecting aspects of the physical world, whether that be mountains, whether that be open ocean, flat plains, close to the equator, far from the equator, you know, high pressure, low pressure, up in the sky, down towards the ground. So I don't believe that a witch can completely change weather systems. However, I do have experience, and I know others who've had the experience of temporary, you know, relatively short term, highly localized events that seem to have no explanation but they have done a working to create. So I think it really all depends on what kind of scale we're referring to here. Do I think that one practitioner can change an entire weather system? No, personally, I don't. 
However, small localized temporary changes, I think that's more doable than a huge system change because the weather is such a complicated thing. There's a reason that we still fail at predicting it most of the time. It's because it's just based on so many different factors that it's really hard to just change like one thing. Have you read Weaving Fate? If so, do you what do you think of hyper sigils, the black book and other practices in Weaving Fate? I have Weaving Fate, don't I? Hang on, let me just check. Oh, that's Weaving Liminal. Okay, that's a different book. I haven't read Weaving Fate. If I got a pen, if I got a pen that I can, what's this? You are my script from earlier. Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm just trying to find, ah, here we go. Piece of paper. Oh, let's get this. I'll note this down and then I'll have a look. So that's weaving fate. I'll, I've noted that down. I'll have a look and see um, what it's like. Cause I've never heard of it before. I, I got confused with weaving the liminal and weaving fate. So I'll have to see. And then I'll get back to you. Although to be fair, I have recently bought so many books it's kind of ridiculous. When I went to the local secondhand bookshop back at the end of October, I bought an embarrassingly large amount of books, like an, a full on embarrassingly large amount of books. So I really need to like keep, <laughs> I need to keep reading before I buy anything else. <laughs> random just songs in my head i've completely lost where i was i think i'm about i think i was about here i'm sorry if i've missed anyone it jumped so bad i think i was about here um thoughts on the magical import no thinks mm, wow words thoughts on the importance of magical mindset in magic and witchcraft and tips for being an effective magical practitioner in the long run so okay i'm gonna answer these kind of two separate answers and i hope it makes sense so the importance of magical mindset in magic and witchcraft is quite high there's a reason why especially when doing ritual magic there are particular clothes that are worn or not worn, particular things that are done in a particular order, particular fragrances that are used, particular candles that are burned, songs that are sung, words that are said. These kind of things help to put us into a mindset that is separate from our mundane lives. So I mentioned it in the last reaction video, how if you've seen it, you'll know the scene I'm talking about where they're wearing the, the cloaks and all the cloaks are the same and they're not wearing any shoes. That isn't a necessity when it comes to magic. However, it's exceptionally useful for putting us into that mindset. And that's why a lot of the time when you read a book and they say, wear a ritual cloak or be barefoot, usually these things don't have any kind of um, physical impact on the working. It's a psychological impact on the working that's important. So if you struggle to focus in spell work and ritual, you're gonna to struggle to work your energy effectively. You're gonna to struggle to visualize or plan the outcome effectively. And then you may not end up with not a successful working or not as a successful working. I forgot to breathe again. <laughs> so oftentimes you will do these things in order to separate us from the mundane world so that we leave behind the things that are inhibiting our magical practice so you might have a shower before you undertake spell work and ritual that shower is essentially designed to wash away any stress any thoughts i mean you can turn it into more of a ritualistic shower if you want but generally showers are just seen as being a very good place to kind of clear off the day set the mundane aside start on the magical you then might put on a particular outfit. Now it doesn't have to be a cloak. It could be just a particular set of clothes. It could make you feel a certain way, whether it's something vintage, something that is similar to what your ancestors may have worn or something similar to the clothes of a particular tradition that you are working within. 
you may want to wear nothing, you may want to wear something specific. So for me, I take off my boots. I wear giant soled boots, like ginormous platforms. And I find that I work way better when I'm barefoot. So I will take off the boots, take off the chains, take off everything else. I wear these, you can't see them, I'm realizing. They are like hippie trousers. They're like, I'll see if I can stand up to show you. They're like really baggy, these things. Can you even see that? They're like really baggy kind of harem style trousers. And I find these are really useful because like, they're just like super flowy. And then I'll often pin my hair back to get it out of the way. And these are all things I do just to set the scene. I then have particular incense that I burn, which really helps to kind of get you in the right headspace. So you know, like you end up kind of training yourself kind of Pavlov style and, um, so that when you smell that smell of incense, you know that it's time to work. And all of this goes into setting the scene for really good magical practice. Now, of course, you might not need this. You might not need any of this. You might find that you can just get into ritual like that. But especially at the start, it can be a little bit tricky. When it comes to tips for an effective and powerful practice in the long run, I would say biggest thing, don't skimp on the underlying understanding. So make sure that you are understanding mind calming, make sure that you're understanding how to center, how to ground, how to work your energy, how to visualize, even if it's not a visual visualization, even if it's just the ability to plan ahead in your workings, really good to have that kind of foundation of understanding. And then just make sure that you're always, you're always trying to develop that understanding further. It's not a case of, okay, I've read this beginner book once, now I never have to look at it ever again. It's really worth always building up on that so you can really develop the practice. Oh my goodness, I'm talking so much. And I'm completely forgetting to breathe. I think this will just be the, the scene for today's live stream is just me forgetting to, to breathe mid-sentence. <laughs> How do you know if a deity is who they say they are? So it's a case of looking at things in your life that might they might be influencing. So I'm a big one for saying that not everything is a sign, but I would specifically, if you have a deity reaching out to you, ask if they are able to show you something significant. All of these deities have associated mythology it's really worth looking and reading into their mythology, understanding the things that they represent, the things that they don't, the colors that they represent, the animals that they represent, the plants that they represent, working on that. You can then start doing readings, interacting with ancestors or guides, just your subconscious. See, the thing is, right, I'm uncertain, obviously, of your situation here, but the fact that you're asking the question about that you're questioning whether a deity is who they say they are, that's your subconscious saying that something isn't right. And if your subconscious is already making that question, then it could be worth really questioning it because usually it's a very, um, there's this feeling you get, you know, when you know that someone's lying, but they're not being honest with you and you know that they're lying, but they refuse to tell you that they're lying, that feeling that you get, is something that you really can't shake. And so it's really worth doing some readings, looking into the mythology, even the best trickster spirits, even trickster deities, they aren't gonna be perfect. You know, they are gonna slip up sometimes. And so it's really good if you think it is a particular deity that you do the research, do as much research on that deity as possible because you might find that something doesn't line up. And if something doesn't line up, that might be why. So I'm doing it again as I'm like, <laughs> I'm reading and I'm not, uh, I'm not speaking. Was Walking With Trees a good book? I haven't started it yet. Where even is it? I've put it somewhere. I've put it somewhere, there it is. I haven't started reading it yet. I've just been too jam packed with other things I need to do. So I will get around to reading it, just not yet. I have like 
a ginormous reading list of things that I'm like part way through. So I feel like I really need to finish first and then I can start uh, doing anything else. Because the problem I have is that I tend to start like a hundred books at once and then I never finish them and then I have to constantly keep like restarting them. I mostly mute. Can I still practice or does it affect my magic if you're not vocal? No, not at all. Not at all. It's not going to affect it whatsoever. You don't have to say anything out loud if you don't want to. It's all about your energy and your intention. For some people, they find that talking out loud works really well for doing what they want to do. For other people, they don't know anything at all. Not know. They don't do anything like verbally at all. And they still have a really successful magical practice. It's all about focusing your energy and your intention. Have you used crystals in your practice? I do use crystals in my practice. I don't buy them anymore, but I have a large selection that I will still use occasionally. I don't use them super duper often, especially not in larger workings, but in smaller workings, I will still use them. How important is doing proper spell work and practices versus setting an intention behind the work? Neither is useful without the other. And I'm gonna clarify that a little bit. So intention is finding out what it is that you want, is saying, okay, I would like to be able to improve myself in my work. I want to get a promotion. So you've set that intention, but you're not doing anything about it. So how, how are you gonna manifest anything if you aren't doing anything about it? But equally, if you're just doing random spell work with no end goal, with no intention means that you don't know what you're aiming for. You're just putting energy out into the world and it's not doing anything because you've not told it what it is that you want out of it. So you can do as much spell work and ritual as you want, but if you have no goal from that spell work, if you're just like raising energy and releasing it, raising energy and releasing it, but you don't have any plan, any intention behind it, it's not gonna manifest. If you have intention, but you're not putting any energy into it, it's not gonna do anything. You need them both to be together for it to be really successful because one without the other is lacking in some way. Now, of course you do have the idea of um, the law of attraction and all that stuff. I don't work with the law of attraction, but even then you still have to be implementing that energy into your life. So it's still not just an intention. It's, it's more than that. It's the way you interact with the world that changes. So one without the other is completely useless. You really need them both together in some way to have a successful working. Where does a hex go when it backfires onto you but you have protections up? Does it still backfire onto you? It depends what kind of protection you've got. If you've got something that's like a scapegoat, so this is like a witch's bottle, then it will be absorbed into the witch's bottle. That's where it goes. If you have something more like a shield that it just bounces off, it's a little bit like how if you bounce a basketball, at some point it's just gonna stop bouncing because that energy has been used up. Same applies when it comes to magical practice. So you might find that you have backfire onto you, but at some point that energy is just gonna run out. So even if it's just ricocheting, out and back, out and back, out and back as it's trying to get back to you again, at some point it's just gonna run out of steam and it's just not gonna be able to do it anymore. So it's kind of the two, the two ways of doing it. You kind of have the scapegoat option where you have something absorbing it for you, whether that is, say, spirits that are helping to protect you, whether that is a witch's bottle that's helping to protect you, or it's essentially just like gonna bounce itself off that wall so many times that it just loses all of the energy. Now, the only time that isn't going to happen is if you have something like a battery that's powering it, or if you've put a lot, a lot of energy in it and say it's attached to the cycles of the moon, then essentially it's just gonna keep ricocheting off you until your barriers fail and then it's gonna attach itself onto you. In which case you would want to do a good bit of cleansing to really disrupt that energy so it, it loses its focus, so it can't really do it anymore. Oh, I never knew how much difference being able to breathe out your nose would actually make. 
because I'm so out of breath all the time. And it's because I can't breathe through my nose, so I have to wait till I get to the end of a sentence. And then I can breathe. I would love to know if you can speak about how to start dream slash astral work. Okay, straight off here. Dream work and astral work, two different things. I actually have a video coming out next week. I think it's next week that's the difference between dreams and astral projection. So you've asked this at a good time because dream, dreams and astral projection, not the same thing. Completely different categories. You can astral project during sleep, which is what a lot of people start doing, but you can astral project while you're wide awake. You don't need to be asleep to astral project, whereas you do need to be asleep to dream. One is inside your head, one is outside of your head. So two different things. They can often be confused though, especially at the beginning because it's way easier to astral project during sleep than it is during the day. So, so, <sighs> I need to learn to fucking breathe. Basic things like interpreting dreams. Interpreting dreams is not something anyone can teach you. You can buy as many dream interpretation books as you want, but the reality is, is that the meaning of a dream is entirely dependent on how you perceive that dream. For instance, if I see a shark in my dream, it's not something that I'm gonna be afraid of because I'm not scared of sharks and I like them. <laughs> Whereas if someone who's got a phobia of sharks sees a shark in their dream, it's gonna be a very different response and ultimately it's gonna be a very different meaning. So when it comes to interpreting dreams, it's really important to look inwards, not outwards. You're gonna to have to think of your experiences in a certain place with a certain plant, with a certain um, stone, with a certain animal, whatever it is that you want to interpret. It's, it's the way your brain perceives that item. So for instance, if you were once bitten by a snake because you didn't listen to your parents' warnings or something, and then 20 years later you see a snake, a venomous snake in your dream, that could then be telling you that you need to listen to the guidance of your elders. But to someone else who maybe has never been bitten by a snake for that same reason, it's gonna have a different meaning. So when it comes to interpreting dreams, it's all about figuring out what that thing you're trying to interpret means to you. Now, when it comes to dreaming in general, I would always recommend dream journals because just because something doesn't seem symbolic or significant at the time, it doesn't mean that in a week, two weeks, a month, two months, it won't be significant. So I'd always recommend anything that you remember in a dream, you take note of it because it can be really significant. Ooh, what's the difference between an air witch, an earth witch, a fire and a fire witch? This seems like a really, am I just, am I, I'm just being daft I think, but this seems like a really simple question with a very simple answer. The difference is, is that they work with a different element. So like if you're an air witch, you are predominantly going to work with the air element. If you're an earth witch, you're gonna predominantly work with the air element. And if you're a fire witch, you're gonna predominantly work with the fire element. That doesn't mean that that's all that person is gonna work with, but it, it goes to describe the majority of their magical practice simplified into a single title. That's really the only, that, that's, that's really as simple as I can go without diving into every single type of elemental practitioner. Um, but I have done full videos on the different elements and how they might be worked with in your magical practice, which might be useful if you do want to learn more about each different type. Though I, I warn you, each of those videos is about an hour long. So that's like four hours of your life gone right there. <laughs> Have you read any of the Lisa Chamberlain books? Lisa Chamberlain. I might need some clarity <laughs> on the books that they have read, not read, written. My problem is I'm bad with names, right? I'm great with like pictures. I, if I look at the cover of a book, I will remember it forever. If I look at the author of that book, I will forget it in 10 seconds. I might have done, um, if there's any like really popular ones that they've done, let me know and I will see if I can remember it. Wait, is this the person that did like the the love the love spells one? I have it somewhere. Wait, let me just see. No, no, that's a different author. Never mind, ignore me, I'm being daft. Ooh, 
oh, oh, oh. Would you recommend the book Green Witch by Aaron Hiscock? I was thinking of picking it up, but I'm unsure if it's a good read. I have done a full review of it in my Green Witchcraft Books video. So if you want a full review, check out the Green Witchcraft Books video. There should be chapters in it so you can like click to the book that it is. It is meh. It's not the best. It's not the worst. It's very basic. It's a good first book on green witchcraft. If you want something that's super in-depth, super detailed, I wouldn't recommend it alone. But if you're just getting into it, it's not bad. I, it's one of the better ones that they've done. Um, some of the other ones I really, really don't like that much. <laughs> Try to be civil. Um, but that one, it's, it's meh. It's all right. It's good for a very beginner green witchcraft book. That didn't sound like a very good review, did it? I promise I was... <laughs> I did go more in-depth in that other video. At least I think I did. Can you imagine if I just, like, said the exact same things and just completely forgot about it? How does the Crooked Path book cover look like? I don't want to get the wrong one. Um, where did I put it? I think my mum might still have it, but it has a deer skull on the front of it. That's what I remember. It's, it's got a deer skull on the front and it's by um, Calden. Calden? Calden. K-A-L-D-E-N. Calden. Calden? I don't know. The Crooked Path by Calden. I want to say Calden, but I reckon that's wrong. And it has, a, it has a deer skull on the front. I'm just seeing if I can find it, but I think I loaned it to my mum. <laughs> I need to organise all of this again, because nothing is in the right place. Yeah, I don't think it's there, I'm pretty certain my mum has it, but it's The Crooked Path by Calden and it has a deer skull on the front of it. If you, if you wake up at 3 or 4 a.m. every day, does it mean anything in witchcraft? I'll be honest, no. Simply because, and other people might debate me on this one and that's fine, simply because your brain gets into patterns. So for instance, if there was a noise that went off at 3 a.m. every day for a week, and you maybe didn't notice the noise, but you woke up every day at 3 a.m. for a week, because your brain really likes doing things repetitively, you might find that from that point on, every day you then wake up at 3 a.m., even when the noise has stopped. Same happens Every, you know, 4 a.m., 2 a.m., 1 a.m., whatever it might be, there might be something that's disturbed your sleep at a certain time, whether that's the beep of a fire alarm or whether that's a car alarm going off outside or, you know, something happening. You might find that even after the noise has completely stopped, your body continues to repeat the pattern. And most of the time, these things of waking up at certain times of night have a very specific, very mundane cause. Sometimes you might find that you wake up for a spiritual reason. However, I will say very clearly here that most of the time it's a completely mundane, completely normal reason and your body just likes to repeat it. And oftentimes you may find that one day you just don't, you just notice that you're not doing it anymore because your body has kind of broken itself out of that cycle. Doing it again, where I stop reading. <laughs> no, where I stop talking. Have you interacted with any cryptids or elementals? Um, both to a degree. It depends on where you draw the line on cryptids. I was an elemental practitioner for a long time, so I worked with the elements for a very long time. <laughs> and that was kind of my main focus of my practice for a, while, a long while. When it comes to cryptids, it really depends on what you classify. Obviously, some people are going to classify different things. So some people would call fairies cryptids. I would call them spirits. Some people would refer to elementals as cryptids. I refer to them as spirits. So it really all depends on where you draw the line. But I've had a lot of experiences with the strange and the unusual um, that are just really interesting. And I love learning about that kind of stuff as well. So... A tentative both, but it really depends on where you draw the line on cryptids. Do, 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 
I only just got to the point about the books I was talking about earlier. Oh, goodness. Right, it's gonna jump. There we go, it jumped. Right, I'm gonna scroll back up again. I knew it was gonna do it. You can always tell because it like freezes for a minute and you're like, oh boy. I know what it's gonna do next. I hope I haven't lost anything. I really hope I haven't lost anything. Ah, right, here we go. Yeah, this. I didn't... I didn't lose anything, miracle! Do you have any favourite essential oils or even favourite crystals? So essential oils, patchouli. <laughs> Patchouli, oh my god, I love patchouli so much. I will, if I had the option to use it in everything, I would. I absolutely love patchouli. And then crystals, obsidian, smoky quartz, citrine, I don't care if it's heated amethyst or if it's natural citrine, as far as I'm concerned, it has the same energy, does the same thing. Oh, I just hit some nerves there, I know it, but I really don't care. <laughs> and then um, I love labradorite. Those are like the ones I use the most besides straight, quartz um those ones are my favorites though typically i'll only use like tumble stones i don't use like really big pieces i read somewhere that you shouldn't do a spell with children in the house what are your thoughts on that um i'm <laughs> i'm mainly just confused as to the why i mean most books will tell you to do spell work and keep children and pets outside of the room because obviously they're a ginormous distraction. Now that doesn't mean they're bad, but children and pets are really distracting, you know. Stop touching that, don't eat that, get it out of your mouth, is something that you hear quite a lot when you're around people with both small children and pets of any age. So I can understand the appeal of not having pets and children in the room. I don't think there's any great necessity to get them out of the house. I feel like that is a little bit extreme because not everyone has the ability to just pawn their small child off on another person. You know, not everyone has that luxury. So I'd say just the room is kind of good enough or just doing workings when they're asleep so that you can, you obviously know that they're safe and they're not gonna be getting into stuff they're not meant to, but also you have that quiet to be able to do the working that you need without the distractions. I don't think that getting it out of the room, getting it out of the house is, necessary at least i've never known anyone need to do that unless you're doing something really intense like really really intense i don't think you really need that is witchcraft your full-time job in a way it is but not youtube so my main job is my shop my business Witchcraft supplies, mystery boxes, spell kits, all those things. That's my main job. And then I have the YouTube channel, which is kind of an addition that I just started one day when I was mid nervous breakdown and thought, yeah, this sounds like a good idea. <laughs> and now we're still here. Um, so it kind of all merges together. So my job is in essence, teaching and sharing witchcraft content. It's just in some ways it's education and in some ways it's supplies and events and talks and shows and all of that kind of thing. So, kind of. It kind of is my job, just not all of it is YouTube. What was the first spell you ever did? I have no idea. <laughs> no idea. Um. I, I was, I've been practicing for 16 years, like actively practicing, but I know that I was doing energy work before that point. Um, so I don't actually know where you would define the first official spell. And honestly, I don't even remember it because at the very start, I didn't have a book of shadows at all. And um, I, I just didn't make one. I didn't know you should make one. <laughs> and I kind of regret it now. Obviously I didn't know any better at the time, but I have no real information about the first like year of my practice by the time i started my first book of shadows i kind of lost some of that information so you can already tell when i'm writing in the first book of shadows i have that it's 
it's already like into my practice a little bit and then I've got like random notes dotted around in random notepads so I don't remember which is kind of sad because I really wish I did remember but I just don't <laughs> do you believe in reality shifting um no 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 I mean if if you enjoy doing it and you think it works for you then sure but to me in every way that it's been explained to me by people who do it and who people who and from people who know about it everything to me just seems like visualization like I think astral projection is one thing the experiences on the astral plane are very different to simply visualization but I've never had anyone who does it explain it to me in a way that says it as being anything more than visualization now visualization can be exceptionally powerful and don't let me say that it, it's that I don't believe in reality shifting fully on that visualization is so unbelievably powerful do I believe that they are actually visiting Hogwarts via shifting no and I'm, I've always been a bit confused it took me a few months to realize shifting used to mean a very different thing within the magical community than it does today there were different types of shifting like m shifting and today it's been kind of completely overrided by this TikTok shifting. Now it's not solely limited to TikTok, but because TikTok is so big, it's kind of overrided all of the other examples of shifting, which included like astral shifting and all of that stuff. I just, I'm confused as to what makes it different to visualization. If anyone has any more information on it, if anyone does it and you can explain how it's different than visualization, I would love to know. I'm very open-minded on the subject. It's just that I, have yet to be explained it in a way that shows it to be anything more than visualization. Does amethyst fade in regular light? If it's very bright light, it can. If it's hot as well, it can. I think standard like indoor bulbs, it won't fade from. I've never had any problem with it, but if you've got it under like a halogen light or under a light that produces a lot of heat, then it can fade as well as sunlight. I feel like I'm having a workout today. I love me a good allergic reaction. I promise I'm fine. I'm just, I'm just kind of allergic to cats. So I can't breathe out my nose. <laughs> I read on TikTok something about familiars, pets, animals, etc. Oh, you know where I'm going with this. Can you explain what it is? I can't find anything about it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Civil. Keep it nice. Um, so... A familiar is a spirit that you enter into contract with to assist you in your magical workings. It's a give or take, well no, a give and take relationship where you are interacting with that spirit, you offer them energy or offerings or whatever it is that they ask for and in return they can assist in the spiritual planes to manifest spell work and ritual or they can help get information for you which they can then bring back. Now the idea of familiars being animals appears to have come from ideas that were really started during documentation of witch trials, where it kind of became recognized that cats and toads and ravens were all associated with, with witches and that they were therefore familiars or imps disguised as animals. And now a lot of people will call their family pet a familiar. Now, if you do, fine, do whatever you want. I do, however, think that it kind of diminishes what a familiar does because your family cat cannot traverse between realms of existence, whereas a familial spirit can. However, if your pet dies, that pet in spirit form can then be a very useful familiar if it does choose to become a spirit familiar. So it's an interesting topic because depending on kind of where you fall, some people consider animals to like living animals to be their familiar. For me personally, in all of my experience with familiars, I've never known anyone have a pet familiar that does anything related to what a spirit familiar does. There's a good book by Raven Gramassi. It's called... The Witch is Familiar, something like that. It's by Raven Gramassi. That's a good one on familiar spirits about interacting with them in the astral plane and about creating the, the bond and the binds between a practitioner and a familiar. It's really, really interesting read. 
And there's a few others out there as well that are good, but that's the one that I really like at the moment for familiars. Thank you, thank you so, so much, Bill. Thank you so, so much. Whew, gonna, hmm, water. Water, water, water. Do, 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 do. Right, I'm trying to figure out where I was. Let's see. I always lose where I am so quickly. <laughs> it's almost like a sea of words. When do you recommend a new witch start working with deities? Whenever you feel comfortable to, I suppose. Some people say that deities aren't for beginners. Some people say that deities are for beginners. I say it doesn't really matter as long as you feel comfortable in recognizing who you're working with and you are comfortable with knowing what is required of you in order to maintain a healthy communicative relationship back and forth. So if you don't yet know how to give offerings or you don't yet know kind of how to pick up on energies, then having a relationship with a deity can be difficult because you don't know when they're present, you don't know when they're influencing, you don't know how to give them offerings. So I would say learn the beginner information, but after that point, as long as you feel comfortable and as long as you're being safe, it's really up to you to decide when you feel comfortable kind of making that step forwards. I'm trying to figure out where I was again. Have you ever experienced imposter syndrome or doubted your craft? How did you overcome it at the time? Oh, I experience it all the time. I think every person like on YouTube or on a platform of some kind probably experiences more often than not imposter syndrome. And then lots of other people will experience it as well. For me, the big way for me to overcome it is to not pay attention to other practitioners. And it can be a little frustrating, I suppose, for you out there listening, because I get asked a lot like, what witchcraft YouTubers do I watch? And what witchcraft Instagram channels do I follow? And the reality is, is I don't follow any, for good reason. And it's because if you constantly compare your craft to other people's, you are always going to be disappointed. Because there's always something that they're gonna do better than you. There's always something that they're gonna do more frequently than you, or that looks prettier than you, or that seems better than what you can do. Comparison is the worst thing that you can do. That's in everything. If you really enjoy art, stop comparing your art to everyone else's because it's gonna make you feel shit because there's always someone that's better than you. If you are practicing witchcraft, if you watch a lot of content and it's not always educational, you know, you're not really gaining anything from it, you're just doing it because you're interested in it. If you're finding that after you've consumed a lot of the witchcraft style content, you feel like shit, it's probably because you're comparing yourself even subconsciously to the practice of other people and it's not healthy. And social media does it with every platform, with beauty, with fitness, with our physical bodies, with education, with everything. There's always someone out there who's doing it better. And so you're always gonna end up feeling like shit and you're always gonna feel like you don't belong in the community. So I just got to the point where I was like, you know what, screw it. I'm just not gonna watch any content from other content creators in the same field as I am. So I'm never comparing myself to another person because I don't know what the other people are doing. You know, I follow a few people on social media that are, you know, people that I would consider acquaintances, occasional friends, you know, we'll send each other a message every now and then. But besides that, I tend to not follow anyone because it's the best thing I've ever had to not feel like shit all the time, to make me not feel like imposter syndrome is taking over my life. So that's what I did. It's obviously not gonna work for everyone, but if you do find that if you use social media a lot and you're finding a lot of comparison, maybe cutting it out a little bit and switching to different content creators in different fields so that you can follow them instead can be really useful. <laughs> Hi, 
How does one make sun water and what does it do? So essentially solar water, lunar water, sun water, moon water, whatever you want to call it, they are waters that have been infused with the energy of that particular celestial body by being in its presence. So sun water is made by exposing sun in water to the sun and moon water is created by exposing water to the moonlight. And then it's taken in before the sun sets for sun water and it's taken in before the sun rises with moon water. And it then contains a small amount of the energy in that particular celestial body that you can then work with later. So whatever correspondences the sun has, solar water now has. Whatever correspondences the particular phase of the moon that you created moon water in has, that moon water now has. I have to say it's not the most useful item that has ever been made, mainly because water goes off really badly. If you're planning on drinking it, make sure it's fresh water, make sure there's nothing else in the water such as crystals or anything like that. Make sure that it stays refrigerated, drink ideally within three days at the latest if you're planning on drinking it. You can obviously use it after that point, but water does go bad fast, so just make sure that you use it quickly. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a rancid bathtub of water if you add it into baths or a rancid scrying bowl of water if you're planning on scrying with it. So just make sure to check that it hasn't gone bad. What happened with your mirror last week? Oh, uh, I'm not gonna go full into it, but um, hmm, horrible astral projection. Oh, good God, that was not fun. <laughs> I haven't had many bad experiences with astral projection, but that one was not nice. And woke up straight away, knew that something wasn't quite right figured out what it was real, real quick. Um, because obviously the astral plane is like on top of ours basically, um, kind of like the spirit plane. Um, anything that is in both planes, especially liminal spaces can act as a, as like a, a portal almost between the two. Had to seal that mirror real quick because that was not fun. <laughs> Tremendously bad night that one was, but you know, it happens. Uh, just a note on that as well, if you have like a bad experience with astral projection, don't let that be the defining astral projection experience. Um, I've had a few bad astral projection experiences, I've had many more that are good. Um, so if you start with a bad one, don't think that that then defines all of them. It doesn't, sometimes bad things just happen and you just have to deal with it and then move on from it. <laughs> so I had to seal my mirror, which is the first time I've had to do it in a long, long time. I don't think I'm going to keep it sealed for that long mainly because as far as I can tell I'm gonna have to check obviously but as far as I can tell the entity that I was interacting with is no longer in the space like in the astral plane it's no longer in the same place so I should be able to unseal the mirror soon-ish because I don't like keeping mirrors sealed because I obviously have other spirits in the house that like using mirrors so hopefully I won't have to keep it sealed for too long but I did have to because that spirit was really really nasty and I just didn't want to have to deal with that. <laughs> it's bad enough when you're dealing with it on the astral plane. It's it's even worse if you're dealing with it on the physical plane. So I was like, no, I'm just going to seal it and get this over and done with now. <laughs> so then I don't have to do it later. So four in the morning, I'm just there sealing the mirror, bleary eyed, like I want to go back to bed. <laughs> Thank you so, so much. Oh, I love your name, Lime Candy. I like it. <laughs> How do you get over being scared of spirits manifesting? How can you have the courage to work with deities and not be scared of them? So it's kind of a difficult one for me to answer because I've never been scared of spirits. And I think the way we perceive spirits is gonna be entirely dependent on our experiences of them in the past. So I've been able to see spirits since I was a child. I've always interacted with them. Therefore, I've never been scared of them. But if you haven't interacted with them or you're a member of a community that kind of classically has a very negative impression on spirits, I can understand why it can be really difficult. I always find education is the solution to fear. In like 99% of cases, education is the best resource that you can find. So look into different kinds of spirits that you might find locally, whether they are land whites, genus loci, whether they are fairies or elementals. Look into traditional folklore within your specific area so you can see the kind of spirits that you might end up experiencing, might being the main word here. You don't need to experience them, but you might experience them. When it comes to deities, it's important to remember that most deities are not the kind that wants you to kiss their feet 
feet and beg for forgiveness. Like most deities that people will work with aren't like that. Of course, there are some like that across the world and that's gonna vary depending on culture and tradition. But a lot of deities, particularly deities within more um, folk religions, so rather than kind of widespread worldwide religions, more like culturally specific religions, you'll often find that deities are more human than you might expect. And so once again, education really is the solution to fear in this one. Read local folklore, read the, the texts of mythology in a particular area. If there's any deities that you're interested in learning more about, read their folklore. Because you'll quickly find that a lot of area focused deities, they have a lot of mythology that makes them human, that makes them very relatable, that, that takes away that, that fear that they're going to smite you for simply looking at them the wrong way. I always find that looking at the mythology is a really eye-opening way of perceiving deities. And I mean, you just have to read the Mabinogi. The Mabinogi has some fascinating stories. Even Keridwen's story, it's so, it's so beautiful. Like, her cauldron and her potion was ruined. So instead of just thinking, oh, I'll just make it again, she'd already been doing it for so long that she decided to pursue the person who caused her problems, transforming into different animals as she did. Like, these stories are so beautiful and they, they really allow us to see more in a deity than, than that fear. And I think, long-winded I know as this section was, <laughs> I always find that education is the, the solution to fear in most cases. So if you can read up on specific deities, I mean, some of the most, most popular deities to read the mythology of are Hellenic deities, so, so Greek deities and Roman deities. And they are really wonderful stories to read. And then Celtic deities have got their own histories and, and the Mabinogi is there and like there's so many options. Just, I'd say find a deity that you would like to learn more about and just see how you feel once you've learned their story. Because the word deity I think can really scare people, especially if you come from a tradition where deities are kind of all powerful beings. Whereas, especially in, in more pagan traditions, like neo-pagan style traditions, deities are worked with. They are not worshipped, they are worked with. It's a give and take, not a give, give, give and pray that you'll get something back. So a lot of the times that, that level of fear isn't quite the same as it can be in other traditions. What is a servitor? Ooh, interesting. A servitor is a spiritual being that has been created by a practitioner. So you can work with spirits that exist in their own right. For instance, a familial spirit is a spirit that exists that enters into a familial spirit contract to assist you in workings. That's a pre-existing spirit. A servitor is a spirit that has been created by the practitioner to assist them in a particular task. It's essentially a collection of energy from the practitioner that is then sent in a spiritual form to receive information, to achieve something on the spiritual plane. And then once its job is done, it can then be kept till it's needed again and then it'll be re-energized or it is then dismantled energetically and it's then just released into the ether, you know, just the nothingness. So essentially it's a spirit that is specifically created by the practitioner for a job rather than a, a spirit that exists in its own right. What are your zodiac signs? Sun, rising and moon. My sun is Cancer, my moon is Capricorn and my rising is Aquarius. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. What is going on? Um, would love to know your some of your favourite books or other resources of tra British traditional witchcraft, folklore, folk magic. I am planning on doing a full video on this. I have a few books I still just need to finish before I do it. But two really good ones that I would recommend are A Deed Without a Name and Traditional Witchcraft by Gemma Gary. Though I will be giving you way more options when I do the full video. But I have like three, 
three more, four more that I need to read um, before I can kind of give like a my first video on books on the topic. Have you ever worked with fairies or done fairy craft? I have, um, how do I describe this? I don't work with fairies. I've had lots and lots and lots of interactions with fairies. It's the bonus of having lived in Wales. Wales is jam packed with fairy spirits. Um, I don't actively incorporate them in spell work and ritual. I don't ask for their assistance in any way. So I've experienced them, but I do not actively request their assistance. Oh, is it gonna jump? Oh, no. Okay, it's not gonna jump, miracle. How do you know herb co ha properties? Oh, words. How do you know herb properties? I'm so used to saying correspondences, I automatically say it. Do you look it up every time you write it down in your book of shadows? Uh, wait, do you look it up every time or do you write it down in your book of shadows? Neither. <laughs> And the thing is, is it really all depends on how long you've been using the same herbs for. Because obviously if you're just getting started, you're not gonna remember it all. But I've been using herbs from the very start of my practice. So for me, if say I'm doing a spell for protection, I know exactly the herbs I'm going to grab because I've used them so many times in the past, I know the correspondences off the top of my head. Now, if I'm looking for the correspondences of a particular herb I've never used before, then I will look up the herb correspondences. Um, but for most of the herbs I use, I already know the correspondences just because I've used them so, so many times. It's like essential oils, crystals, those kind of things. You just kind of get to the point where you don't need to look it up anymore because you're just so used to knowing what you're gonna be using for different intentions that you can then just go and grab them. I'm realizing slowly as the live stream is going on, I'm sinking further and further and it's because this chair is so broken <laughs> it's so unbelievably broken so I'm now going to sit on a cushion a very uncomfortable cushion so I can like be higher higher in the seat I'm so desperate to get a new sofa in this room but sofas are so expensive I had no idea how expensive sofas were until I was looking for a sofa I was very lucky that when I moved in I was given two sofas that one of my family members was getting rid of. Sofas are so expensive. So one day I will have a sofa that doesn't sink into the ground after like two hours. Um, ba -ba -da -ba -ba -ba. What is your opinion on the book series, uh, on a book series like Percy Jackson being your child's first introduction to mythology and deities? I'm curious because that's how I was introduced to Greek gods. That's really interesting. That's how I was introduced to Greek gods as well. I think most people I know, our first introduction was kind of with that Percy Jackson-esque experience. And so, I mean, they did a great job. like. A lot of it, I mean, it's not perfect, obviously, but it it's almost like modern mythology in a way. That's kind of how I like to describe these books that are surrounding like a particular topic, because most books surrounding, say, Greek mythology, they are drawing on actual Greek mythology, but Greek mythology is dense. Like, if you actually read Greek mythology, it's, it's a lot. Like, even the translations, it's a lot. So, like, it's almost modern mythology. It contains so many good aspects but it's in a way that children are gonna understand. So I think it's cool. I think it's a cool way of doing it. And I think that's why a lot of people today really, really like Percy Jackson and learning about Greek mythology. Thank you so, so much, Mallory. Oh, I love your name, Mallory. That's an amazing name. That's so cool. Happy Christmas to you too. Well, Hexmas, Hexmas. <laughs> I love that, Hexmas. How have I never heard that before? Happy Hexmas, I love it. I'm trying to figure out where I was. It's jumped again. 
Oh, right, in the meantime, I can do this. Oh, thank you so much, Star, Star Search. Thank you so, so much. Oh, it feels so nice. Can I sense the presence of a deity? Yes, just as you can with um, spirits and just interfering energies. With energy sensing, you're able to sense the presence of deities if they enter into that space. Do -do -do -do. Have you worked with Keranos or Buka? Buka, I always, Buka, Buka, I always say it wrong. Um, Keranos, yes, he's one of my deities. Um, it depends on what, who you're referring to when you say Buka. Now, I always say it wrong. It's because, maybe I'm saying it right. It's just I'm used to it being spelled B-W-C-C-A. And um, it depends, because obviously in some texts, in some more modern traditional witchcraft texts, this figure is considered to be a representation of um, nature in, in, a, in a horned god type of way. But for me, um, Buka is a water spirit in Cornwall. So I'm not sure if they are two different entities or if one is like a more modern interpretation of the other. I'm not quite sure. I'm gonna have to do a bit more research into that. But for me, I'm never, I'm never sure which, which came first. I think one is spelt with a W, one is spelt with a U. So maybe they are two different deities. Um, I'm not quite sure. I've just realized that this cushion is actually cutting the circulation off my ass. <laughs> it's so uncomfortable. Can you do a video about misinformation about deities? Yeah, I'm sure I can do that. I, I can note that down. Have you watched The Witcher 2, um, Witcher Season 2, or Arcane? I haven't watched it yet. I haven't had time. I've I've literally been working every waking minute of every day for the last two weeks. Like, for instance, after this, I'm editing a video, and then tomorrow I have a hospital appointment, and then I'm editing tomorrow afternoon, and then it's Christmas Eve, and then... So I'm spending Christmas Eve and Christmas Day with people, and then I'm starting work again on Boxing Day. <laughs> I am just... I need to make time to sit and watch it. So we'll have to see how long it takes me to um, actually get around to doing it. Have you watched The Discovery of Witches? I can't, I don't have Sky and I am not paying to have Sky. <laughs> um, it's just too expensive. Was that the Bewitched theme song? I'm not sure, I lose track. Right. I'm trying to figure out where I was. I apologize for just going like completely silent for a minute. How do you stop your energies from draining yourself when doing a working address to others? Doing a prosperity spell for a friend, which led your vibrations to lower. How? My first question, how uncontrolled is your energy? <laughs> like, you really, especially if you're doing it for other people, you need to have that on lock. Like, you need to know how much you're willing to give and then put a stopper on it when you're done. Or, even better, do that and get energy from another place. If you're using your personal energy and only your personal energy, you are gonna be so exhausted by the end of it, whether you put a stopper on it or not. You need to find a secondary resource, whether that is the earth, whether that's elements, whether that's the weather, whether that's plants. You need to find something, especially if you're gonna be doing workings for other people, because it's so much harder to know when to stop if you aren't the one that's feeling that energy. So you need to really put a stopper on how much energy you're gonna use, make sure that you can cut it off fully and then 100% I'd recommend finding a secondary resource because unless you are able to contain and raise a huge amount of energy without using anything else, which most people can't, you're always gonna feel like shit after spell work and ritual. You really need to get it from another source. I'd recommend learning how to ground, drawing the energy up from the earth. It's such a useful neutral power bank essentially for spell work and ritual. 
So that way you aren't just making yourself really, really exhausted. Oh, Lance, I didn't see you go. Thank you so much. I'm sorry I didn't say bye to you at the time. Thank you so much for being a mod. I really, really appreciate it. What will your Christmas be like? It, uh, I'm seeing a friend on Friday and then I'm going to my parents on Saturday and then I'm going to my parents on Sunday. And that is it. <laughs> it's not a very elaborate Christmas. We aren't religious folk. We just like Christmas and Christmas gifts and Christmas presents and Christmas food and Christmas movies. <laughs> it's honestly just a very simplistic Christmas. I'll be honest, I, I hate Christmas. Um, I just genuinely just don't, I, it's so stressful. <laughs> Christmas is so stressful. Have you read the book Wicker by Harmony Nice? I have. It's pretty meh. It's a fell. It's it's all right. I mean, it just doesn't go into any kind of detail into anything. It's what you would call neo Wicker. Um, I know that Wicker in itself is already neo paganism, but Harmony Nice's book on Wicker is really neo Wicker. It's kind of a, a modern perspective on a modern religion. So it's it's good if you like Harmony Nice and you want to support Harmony Nice and you want to have like a very gentle introduction into Wicca. Is it going to be the most mind-blowing, informative book you've ever read? No, because it's a very aesthetically pleasing book. But it could be useful if you don't have any other information on the subject and this is your start. And I suspect that for a lot of younger individuals, you would... Um, they would be very appreciative of having it as kind of a first step because it's a very easy read, it's not super complicated and um, it, it suits a style of learning that's very popular today versus, you know, giant textbooks, um, which isn't everyone's cup of tea. Oh, it's going to jump. Ah, oh, I knew it. And scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. I could be here for a while. <laughs> I, I could be anywhere. Ah, oh, no, ah, <laughs> I was here. Now that is the Bewitch theme song. Is it? Maybe it isn't. Maybe it is. No, it is. It is. I gotta trust my instinct on this. It is. <laughs> Could you do a video about storm magic? I mean, I, I can give it a go, yeah. I'll have to see what I can pull together. Cause obviously I don't, it's been a long time since I bothered to do any because we don't get any storms in this blooming country. I'm so annoyed. We used to get loads of storms, but recently we just don't have any storms at all. I'm trying to figure out where I was again. Oh, what is this? Oh, thank you so much. No, is it no? N O E? No? No E. No. 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 I could say this all day and I still wouldn't know. <laughs> thank you <laughs> so, so much. Oh my goodness, I'm so bad at pronouncing names. I would like to see you on Witch Talk. I downloaded Witch Talk and I was on it for all of like five minutes before I saw someone say something really offensive and generally just really awful and then I just deleted the app. I honestly can't stand that place. Like, it's so stressful. Everyone is an absolute asshole in the comment section and honestly, I just don't want to deal with it. <laughs> I keep being tempted. I keep going, oh, but it's an entire community of people that maybe I haven't reached out to yet. And then I spend like more than five minutes on the app and I'm like, no, get away from me, demon. And I delete it again. I've never known a platform with such horrific comment sections. Like I've never, I never, I mean, comments on YouTube are bad enough, right? Don't get me wrong. Comments are awful on YouTube sometimes. But I've never been on an app that has the most brain melting, mental health destroying capacity as TikTok. And I don't understand how people can be on it. Like, 
I don't understand how you don't like lose your mind being on it. It it baffles me. I'm honestly props to you if you can be on TikTok because I couldn't I couldn't do it. I don't think I could ever do it. I was tempted to try and then I just kind of noped out of there real real quick. What about making an initiation ritual when you begin in witchcraft? I mean, you don't really need to. I mean, initiation rituals were for initiation into witchcraft or into a um, initiatory practice. Witchcraft, you don't need an initiation for it. I mean, self-dedication, I think, is one thing. Because self-dedication is something that's done by yourself to dedicate yourself and your learning to the practice of witchcraft. Initiations are primarily done by other people. So I don't even know if it's possible to do a self-initiation. I think you can only do a self-dedication or an initiation, but when it comes to witchcraft, you don't need to be initiated into anything unless you really want to, which is why I've never really touched on it before because I find a lot of people get confused, particularly between, between Wicca and witchcraft and think that they have to do they have to be initiated to practice like eclectic witchcraft. I mean, if it's an initiatory tradition, then of course, yes, initiation is important. But if it's not an initiatory tradition, then you don't really need it. So if cryptids are astral spirits, also, could we use iron tools to protect ourselves? Ah, see, here's the important thing. Iron only affects certain members of fairy spirits not every spirit <laughs> so you can you can go about thinking that you're protected wearing iron and it's only going to protect you from a limited number of a limited type of spirit and it it's it's the one thing i always get with um uh cryptids i watch a lot of cryptid documentaries right i rarely watch tv but when i do i watch blaze now blaze is a particular channel i don't know if you can get it anywhere outside of the uk but you can get it in the uk and they basically do like paranormal things like recently i've been watching one that's i'm trying to remember what it's called um missing in alaska i think is that what it's called and they they talk about different cryptids and like trying to look for information on them and I'm just sitting there going, that's all great, except that was never meant to be a physical animal. That was always a spirit. <laughs> I will sit and I'll, I'll watch it. And I'm like, all of these things that they're describing as spirits, not physical animals. Why are they hunting through the forest for a spirit? So for me, a lot of the cryptids that we see, once you've studied enough kind of mythology and, and local legend in certain areas, you start to notice that a lot of the cryptids that are meant to be like animals of actually less like animals and more like spirits, which is why I find it's difficult to draw the line between spirit and cryptid, because what one person might call a cryptid, I would refer to as a spirit. Like for me, mermaids are not physical animals. They have always been spirits because I've always interacted with them as spirits. And to me, they've not been anything other than spirits, but for other people, they would call a cryptic an animal. No, a mermaid, a cryptid, like an animal. Um, so yeah, but iron, iron is not gonna help you against most spirits. Some spirits, yes, iron will help. Some um, fairies, for instance, iron will help, but not all fairies. And so it's just really important to make sure you have other protections there as well. Can it be dangerous to work with deities? Yes, but no more dangerous than say working with a person or a spirit, or it really depends on how much of an asshole you're gonna be. It's probably the, the bluntest I can, I can make that, because um, you can interact with deities, and as long as you are um, being genuine and um, courteous and respectful, then I, there isn't too much that can go wrong with it. What goes wrong with it is when people are offensive, cruel, um, generally just not nice people, then that deity might go, you know what, screw you. Um, so I think it, when it comes to working with anything, it's just important to have that level of respect. I'm gonna have to move this cushion again um, because my ass hurts. <laughs> On the topic of liminal spaces, how do you feel about people calling spaces like empty malls or school hallways liminal spaces? I don't, I mean, 
it's not up to me what people decide to call a liminal space, you know? But for me, a school hallway does not count as a liminal space. Because what is it liminal between? That That's a thing, isn't it? Like, people often, often do these, like, compilations on YouTube of, like, reacting to liminal spaces, and it's just like an empty corridor, and it's like... It's not really a liminal space though, is it? Cause like, to me anyway, maybe it's just the witchcraft folklore definition of liminal space. A liminal space is a place betwixt and between. So it's between land and sea. It's between meadow and forest. It's between um, dawn and day. It's between dusk and midnight. You know, it's it's this, this in-between space. So, I don't understand how an empty shopping centre, shopping mall, is a liminal space. Because what is it between? If anything, it's the time of day that would make it a liminal space. So for instance, like, a shopping mall at twilight would be a liminal space, not because of the location, but because of the time. I'm confused. It might just be that the definition of liminal space is different depending on which sector you're looking at. But when it comes to witchcraft, I don't know what it's liminal between. And m maybe it is liminal between something, and I just don't know, but I don't really understand what an empty shopping mall is liminal between. I think really a better definition of it would be eerie. Like an empty school corridor is eerie, because we only ever traditionally see school corridors full of children. Or like, an empty shopping mall is an eerie space to be because it feels wrong to be there because there's no one else there. I don't really think it's necessarily liminal, I think it's more just weird. Like it's just an odd feeling when you're in that space because it's different than how it normally is. Are there any substitutes for toxic herbs such as belladonna? Yes, but what are you using it for? This is this is always the question I have. So like it's it's not as simple as just saying, what can I substitute belladonna for? It's it's why were you planning on using it and then find a suitable substitution that fits into the same associations. So it's all well and good having a substitution for something, but if it doesn't work with what it is you wanted to use it for, then it's not really a substitution. So when it comes to substitutions, you can't really just, for instance, Google substitution for belladonna. What you really need is you need to find the particular reason that that plant is used in a particular working, and then search up a herb or a plant or a flower that's also used for the same purpose that you can then substitute. Otherwise, you're just gonna be diminishing the working and you may as well just not bother using that plant at all. You may as well just say, okay, well, I'm just scrap it, I'm just gonna take the entire plant and substitution out of it and just work with what's left. Otherwise it just it just becomes this vague kind of pointless thing to use. I hope that makes sense. But that one I, I hear a lot, like I hear people saying like, you can substitute every plant for rosemary and it's like, well, you really can't. You can substitute a lot of things for rosemary because rosemary has a lot of associations but it's not gonna cover every plant that has ever existed in every area of the world. So you really have to start getting more specific. <laughs> what is your least favorite episode of The Vampire Diaries? Hands down, it's the one where I'm, I can't even say it because I don't want to spoil it for anyone. I don't know how to say this where, where I, can't, I don't spoil it for anyone. Um, season seven, death of a character that's been in it for a long time. And that's as vague as I'm, that's as, that's as close as I'm going to get to it. But if you've watched it, you will know I cry for like five or six episodes straight. I can't handle it. I can't watch season seven anymore. I get to season six and then I just stop watching it because I can't can't do it because I know what's coming and I, a heart can't take it. Favourite colour? Black or green if black doesn't count because a lot of people are like mm, black's not a colour, black's the absence of colour. Fine, if it's not black then green. <laughs> then green. Just 
Oh, no, it's going to... God damn it! <laughs> I knew it. I was so close to getting to a particular question and then it jumped. Okay. <sighs> just keep going. Just keep going. Just keep, just keep, just keep. Okay. Oh, I'm actually not that far off the bottom. It's all right. I'm not, I'm not that far off the bottom. I've been interested in witchcraft on and off, but keep finding it hard to get into it due to being scientifically minded. Any advice? I mean, I'm scientifically minded. It's just a case of finding things that work for you. Like, it depends on obviously what your background is in, and it depends on the tradition and the practice that you're looking into. Some of them are definitely more leap of faith type traditions than others. Some of them are much more grounded in something that you can understand in a way, like energy and... and um, battery and, and the things that I've also seen in other aspects of the world like science can also be applied to witchcraft. Witchcraft is not the absence of science. It's simply science with the addition of something that's not entirely accepted and understood. And I mean most of the people who were practicing witchcraft were very intelligent people. Often they were the only people who could read and write. They were often healers within the area and had an understanding of the science of the time. So I think it, it's about shaking um, the kind of fantastical representation of witchcraft that we see a lot within movies and media and instead replacing it with a more scientific understanding of it. And it can be really difficult to do and it can take a long time to kind of make that shift, but it's well worth it <laughs> in the end anyway. <laughs> Witchcraft is still being practiced in Russia. I mean, yeah, witchcraft is still practiced everywhere, <laughs> basically. I don't think I know of a single location around the world where there isn't some form of magical practice within that culture. Like, it's still everywhere, it's just in different forms. <laughs> I've really been wanting the Moonology Oracle deck for a long time and my friend got me it for Christmas and it was a knockoff. Oh no, that's awful. Holy shit. I have the Moonology deck. It's really beautiful. It is really nice. It's such a shame about the knockoff though. It's something that's been driving me up the wall for the past few months is that more and more I keep getting adverts for knockoff Oracle and Tarot decks. And usually they're on platforms like Amazon, which for one, abomination. <laughs> Amazon is an abomination on the world. Um, and I shouldn't be so angry about it, but I am because they undercut small witchcraft businesses and make it impossible for us to make money while they stay millionaires. So, it makes me angry. I'm going to try not to get angry. So unfortunately, more and more we're seeing knockoff decks arrive because the problem is, is in the, in the modern world, modern Western world, let's face it, it's a Western problem, is that we want everything for nothing. So we, people don't care anymore about the value of someone's artwork, about someone's time, about someone's dedication. Instead, they'll just look for the cheapest version of that deck and they'll buy it. And then it turns out it's a knockoff and then they blame the artist for a shit deck. I'm not saying that you've done this, by the way, for reference. This is just like a general, general thing I've seen. And then they'll send like the artist of the deck, like a scathing message about how shit the deck was when actually they bought a knockoff deck because they didn't want to pay the artist's price for their work. And it's like, Fully rage inducing. <laughs> I hate it. it. Makes me so mad. We live in this modern world that's just so based on consumerism and buying everything for the cheapest possible price. And it's like, value art, please. <laughs> so that's really annoying because I mean, I'm guessing is the artwork the same, but it's just like really shitly done. Is that is that the difference? You'll have to let me know because I've never got a fake deck because obviously I try to always go like directly from the 
the artist because then you can be sure because the problem is is that more and more now we're finding that these decks are they're becoming better and better at faking them so especially as more and more high high um quality images are being posted online we're seeing more and more rip-offs of decks and like it's just sad it, it, it's honestly just really sad because a lot of these artists feel as though they can't do their work anymore because they just keep being knocked knock, knocked off ripped off kind of both <laughs> kind of both thoughts on meditation and how to incorporate it into everyday practice um i mean i don't do it every single day mainly because i don't have time if you've got time then it can be great it can be a wonderful thing that you can do every single day. I would say if you don't have time though, don't try to force yourself into doing it every single day because forced meditation is not going to do you any good. If anything, it has the potential to just make you more frustrated. Um, so do what you can do, but try not to, you know, if you don't have the time for it, don't force yourself to do it when you're not in a good headspace. wait what sorry i i kind of read that but like i didn't read it have you ever done that it's like when you look at the the time on your phone and then you put it down you're like what time is it i've got no idea um i live in australia i've read that rituals need to be adapted for the southern hemisphere I'm confused about that one. When you discuss spells and rituals, can you let us know if they need to be adapted? They don't need to be adapted. The only time a spell or ritual is ever going to need to be adapted is if it's for a particular seasonal event. So, for instance, if you are doing a Letha ritual at the same time as the Northern Hemisphere, then you're six months out. You should be doing a ritual for the winter solstice, not Letha, the summer solstice. However generally speaking rituals don't need to be adapted just because you're in a different axis and you're not really in a different axis but you know what i mean you're like upside down that's <laughs> that makes me sound stupid you know what i mean though normally with a wheel of you you have to switch it upside down um i've never known of any rituals that are not based on the wheel of the year that would need to be adapted in such an extreme way just because you're in a different country you might find that you want to adapt different herbs for that particular working to suit the plants that you have in your local area and in which case that should be done regardless of whether you're in the southern hemisphere or whether you're just in a different country i'll be interested though have you ever has anyone else ever heard of a standard ritual that's not like a sabbat ritual that needs to be completely adapted for the southern hemisphere let me know because i have to say i've never heard of a working that's not related to a sabbat needing to be changed that much um for a different hemisphere interesting i'll have to look into that one what are your favorite protection good luck prosperity charms for the home i only use protection charms i don't typically bother with any charms for anything else because i don't have the space and uh, my favorite protection harm charms are usually rowan charms i love using rowan for protection charms it's like my favorite thing to work with and i will always go back to using rowan charms there is never an embarrassing amount of books. I would argue that there is most definitely an embarrassing amount of books. If you like can't move for books, I think you get to the point where it becomes embarrassing. Or does it just get to the point where you have to say, I need more bookshelves? Maybe that is the answer. Can you do a video on working with animal spirits? At the moment, I don't plan to because I don't work with animal spirits. I work with, and like, um, people who've passed over spirits so some of them are ancestors some of them are just people spirits um i don't really work with any kind of animal spirits currently if i ever do i'm sure to make a video on it at some point in the future but at the moment i don't i know exactly who you're talking about and i also cried oh i get to the yeah tiktok is a terrible place i don't think like all of tiktok is a terrible place um i just i just don't 
I just don't understand. What's this? There's such a thing as the TikTok curse, which has already been performed by a psychic warfare. Honestly, this is the kind of thing that just confuses me, right? Because, like, I obviously have a circle of people I know who practice witchcraft and we all interact with each other, right? And I have to say, I've never known of anyone say to someone, mm, you know what I fancy doing today? I fancy cursing a stranger I've met on the internet. I've never known of a single person I've ever met within the witchcraft community in person who has ever felt the need to do that. And if you feel the need to do that, then that's fine. Just make sure it's justified, you know, just make sure that you're keeping yourself safe and that it's justified and all that stuff, you know, same as always, no shade. But like, I'm confused as to why. That's my main confusion, it's just like, why? Like, <laughs> I don't get it, I don't get it, I don't understand it, it's like the whole cursing the moon thing, cursing fairies, I genuinely, I wasn't sure whether it was a joke or whether people were actually being serious. And I'm still not really sure if it's a joke or if people were actually serious. Genuinely still not sure. And I think that that's part of the problem is that it's really hard to tell when people are joking versus when they really aren't. And I, I still to this day don't know whether they were joking about that. So I have kind of TikTok, but I keep deleting it. And like, I, I might end up doing a TikTok reaction video again in the future because I keep being requested to do it. But also I don't really know enough about the TikTok witch talk world to really feel like I have all the information on it but like I really don't want to go exploring because I literally got like five minutes in saw some of the some of the worst TikTok advice imaginable some of the worst comments imaginable and I just went <laughs> I just noped straight out of TikTok I think I might just stick to like pretty aesthetic Instagram like I'm just gonna stick to the calm universe of watching people talk to themselves while they go on a hike or like watching people as they see the northern lights. I think I'm just gonna stick with that. I'm not cut out for like the cutthroat world that is TikTok witchcraft content. I don't think I'm cut out for it. I think I might, I might just stick to like the super calm stuff. Oh, it jumped. <sighs> Right, I'm gonna go back up here. Ah, here we go. Um, I'm hoping that if something super creepy is both astral, spirit, and physical, witch bottles and other iron magic stuff could potentially keep them away from your house. No, no chance, not a chance. Good luck with that one, nope. <laughs> iron is not gonna help you in the slightest unless it's a very particular type of spirit it's not gonna do much like if it's anything other than a spirit that's gonna be negatively impacted by iron you're gonna need to find something stronger something different more it you don't even have to get rid of the iron just add extra things because <laughs> the thing is is that although it's a spirit it doesn't mean it's gonna be hindered by iron but equally it could be so I would say if you're going to have iron protections, make sure you have other forms of protection as well. And also remember that if you protect in the physical, it's still able to influence you in the astral unless you have personal protections as well. So just make sure you cover all of your bases. That's my general rule of thumb when you're working with spirits, full stop. Cover all of your bases. Make sure you know how to seal your mirrors. Make sure that you have personal protections. Make sure you have home protections. Make sure you know how to cleanse. All of this stuff, super useful, because that way you're kind of ready and equipped for absolutely everything. Because you never know, it might come a day where you need to, to be able to, to defend yourself in a way and you're going to need to know how to do that. I think halls are liminal because they're between two or more rooms. I guess. I mean, to me, I see a hallway as a room in its own right. Like, the, the arch of a doorway is liminal space because it's the actual in-between. But surely a corridor is a room in its own right, especially like school corridors. School corridors are like really big. Like that feels like a room in its own right. It, like the archway of a door or like the windowsill, I could understand as being a liminal space. I don't know, I think it just all depends on scale, doesn't it? Cause like a little tiny corridor, I suppose could be liminal space cause it's small enough to not be a room in its own right. But where do you draw the line on like what's a room and what isn't? 
I don't know. I just think these, like, the liminal space videos on YouTube are just kind of a bit strange. There's not, there's nothing really that creepy about liminal space. Especially not a school cover door at night. Honestly, a school cover door at night sounds like bliss. School cover doors during the day were a nightmare. <laughs> Favourite tarot or oracle deck? Ooh, interesting. So, my favourite tarot deck to work with is uh, the Rider Waite Smith. I find that one just so useful. It's really useful in teaching. It's really useful in just recouping that information. And since I trimmed my Rider Waite Smith deck, I use it so much more. I love it now that it's trimmed. It just, it makes more sense to me. I did, however, get another deck. I've been waiting for this deck for so long. I have the original version of this. This is the Wild Unknown, and I have the full version. I got the full version when it released. I don't remember how long ago that was, but I got the full version when it came out, and then they told me that this was coming out. Now, I waited for so long. I ordered this in the pre-order from Book Depository, and it came from Australia because the artist, Kim Kranz, is from Australia. And I didn't realize it was coming from Australia, so it got stuck in customs for two months. So <laughs> it took so long for this to arrive. If I can get this out, it comes with this tiny, tiny guidebook it's so small it's so small oh my goodness it's freaking tiny and then the cards are also really small and really cute and i just love them this this was my first ever deck the full size version of this this is my full proper tarot i've had um i realized you can't even see it because the light's hitting it i'm hoping that might be a little bit better perhaps um but I love this deck so much. I have the original, but I got so scared of damaging the original because I loved it so much that I decided to get the mini version. So now I can shuffle like proper a shuffle and they fit in my hands. It's sad that you need like a miniature tarot deck just to be able to shuffle it like a normal person. I don't even, I mean, maybe I do have small hands. I'm not sure. But like every other deck that I own is too big. And like, I can actually shuffle this the way I would shuffle a set of cards. So I have this, and this is like my new favorite deck. I really like this one right now. For Oracle cards, I still really like the Living Altar. I use that a lot. It really depends, because like there's some cards that I use that are more like spell cards than Oracle cards. And then there's others that are more Oracle cards than spell cards. So I use the Living Altar deck a lot. The problem is, it's so huge. I cannot for the life of me shuffle it. It's so frustrating. I've also been using the Avalon. You can't actually see it. It's sat right there. The Mists of Avalon deck because I love um, Arthurian Legend and that deck is basically all Arthurian Legend. I love it so much. So I've been using that one a lot for Oracle readings and then I've been using the... Oh my goodness, I spoke about it on an altar video. What is it called? The problem is it's in my, it's in my Oracle card drawer and I don't want to go and get it. Um, are they like spell casting cards? I don't know what they're called, but they're circular spell cards. I have spoken about them in a previous altar setup video. I think it's the, the altar I did in November, that altar I spoke about them. I used the spell cards all the time. When I got sick, I was using the healing spell card along with other ritual items. Um, I use all, basically all of the cards in that deck in spell work and ritual. Especially useful if I'm feeling particularly low energy because the card already has a lot of association in it. I just need to charge it up, which is so good. So those are like my favorite ones that I'm using at the moment. Though I think I have a worktop. I've been saying for months, I'm waiting for the worktop to arrive for the office. It's over there, it's stuck against the wall. And um, as soon as that's up in the workshop office, I'm hoping to do a comparison between the mini one of these, the pocket edition um, Wild Unknown and the full size Wild Unknown so that you can see the difference because I guess unless you've had both of them, you're not gonna notice like the intricate differences between the two and like which one you might want to get if you do like the artwork. So I'm probably gonna do that as one of the first 
videos I do. Oh, and then on that note, I also am going to be doing some Tassiomancy videos. Yes! I got my teacup, finally. I've been wanting to get a proper Tassiomancy teacup, and now I have one. So, um... I'm going to be doing that soon as well. I'm so excited. I got so many ideas for when the workshop is finished because I want to get into doing proper spell work, ritual, divination, teaching videos again. And I feel like I can't do that sitting here. I'm so excited. Okay, sorry. I went a little off topic there. <laughs> Just a little. Oh, you don't need to ever feel bad about being a beginner witch. Like, you really, really don't. Sorry, this was... You'll if, if you're the one that wrote the comment, you'll know who I'm talking to. <laughs> Any advice on simple protection before meditation? Circle casting. So good. Now, obviously, this it depends what you want. So, like, if you're planning on meditating regularly and you want to maintain protection really easily every time you meditate, go for some protective jewellery. Now, that doesn't mean you have to wear it all the time, although I would typically recommend you have personal protections all the time, and jewellery is generally the easiest form of personal protection because it's very discreet and, you know, you can choose whatever you want. I will be doing a video, a full video on how I energise my jewellery, by the way, because I've been asked about that for so long. I've just been waiting for this workshop, and now it's here, and I just need to batten the wall and then cut it and then stick it to the wall. I'm so excited. Sorry. Off topic. Um... So you can use protective jewellery, which is really useful. That way you don't need to do circles every time because you're sitting there and you're meditating and you have that protective jewellery on all the time, which then protects your energetic field, which then stops anything from influencing you. The other option is more of a temporary fix, and that is either shields or circle casting. Now, I have done a video on the three rings energetic shield technique that I use a lot, which is in my video playlist on YouTube. Um, also circle casting, energetic circle casting. It's great to practice generally so that you can maintain it time and time again. It's exceptionally useful if you're only going to be meditating sometimes or you're doing it in a place that you don't know. It's good to cast that circle so that you can protect yourself from any spirits and energies and then you can close it again after you've finished. However, I will say if you're planning on doing circle casting but you're planning on trying to commune with spirits whilst meditating those two things are going to clash with protective jewelry you can specifically program it so that it's only energies that are planning on causing you harm that are being blocked in which case spirits that you want to commune with are going to be allowed in but when you're doing just a general shield a general protective circle it's going to keep everything out unless you can specifically program it to be only the things you don't want. So if you're just getting started doing protective circles, you're going to keep everything out. So just be careful of that if you are planning on communing with spirits. You'd think that I was like a musical theatre kid when I was a kid, but I really wasn't. I just have this like weird obsession with just making noise all the time. I don't know what it is. I think it's just because like I'm so used to like talking to myself and like I never have silence. So when I do have silence, I feel the need to fill it with just unnecessary noise. <laughs> Adapt, ah, that's a good point. Okay, so this is in relation to the changing the ritual for being in the Southern Hemisphere. And it said that adapt rituals only if they incorporate planetary and constellation correspondence. Yes, okay, I completely forgot about that. Thank you for posting that. So essentially, depending on where you are in the world, you're going to have different um, astrological influences and planetary influences and cosmic influences because where things are in the sky is going to change depending on where you are in the world. So if you're using a particular astrological calendar, just make sure that it suits your location. So for instance, if I'm using an astrological calendar that's set up for South America, it's going to be no use for me because I'm both in a different country and in a different hemisphere. So just make sure that you're kind of adapting it for that. Thank you so much, Mama Zeta, Zeta, 
for pointing that out because I completely missed that. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much, Shane. Oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm so glad that I was able to help. Thank you so, so much. It means so much to me. I I'm just glad that I'm able to help. That's always my biggest worry. I'm always worried that like, I'm not gonna be able to actually give anything of any value. So thank you. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm still trying not to cry in this stream. I'm gonna try really hard to get through it without crying. Um, someone did help answer this, but what would you recommend for someone who knows next to nothing about witchcraft? I'm not sure where to start. It's very overwhelming. Okay, I have a an entire playlist, which is just beginner witchcraft. That's what it's called. It's just the beginner witchcraft playlist that covers a lot of beginner witchcraft topics. Um, I would recommend looking into some good beginner witchcraft books, um, figuring out what witchcraft is and what it isn't. Because today, witchcraft is generally used as a blanket term to cover lots of different magical traditions, but not all magical traditions are witchcraft. And also not everything that you might think you know about witchcraft is going to be witchcraft. Some of it might be fantasy, some of it might be different traditions that have just ultimately become lumped under witchcraft. And then go through some basic practices, things like mind calming, meditation, um, centering, grounding, energy sensing, energy manipulation, visualization. These are all really good beginner techniques that will help build a really successful, really um, well-balanced magical practice. And then it's just a case of figuring out some books that you would like to go down, some different paths and traditions that you would maybe like to look at. And I do have some videos in the beginner witchcraft section that about beginner witchcraft books, which are good for like different types, whether you want to go into more energy-based practice or traditional witchcraft, or whether you want something more ceremonial, there's lots of different paths that you can go down. And I know it can feel really overwhelming, but I'm hoping that once you kind of start getting information from different places, um, it can hopefully help fill in the gaps that allow you to figure out which kind of path you want to go down. And also remember that you don't have to just stick to one. If you think that you just want to start with ceremonial magic and then you decide in six months that you don't really want to do that anymore, you can stop doing it and change into something else. You don't need to just do one thing forever. How are you at the moment? I am, I am fried. I'm actually fried. I just want a holiday. I shouldn't say that. The last time I said I wanted a holiday, I ended up getting sick. I don't want a holiday that bad, okay, universe? I don't want it that bad. I just, <laughs> Christmas is stressful, man. Like, I think when, if you've got kids, then like, you can understand how Christmas is like fun. Cause like, you're making Christmas fun for your kid. But when you don't have kids, Christmas is just stressful. <laughs> I'm just like jam packed from now till new year. And even then I just have to keep plowing through and it's, <sighs> It's stressful. <laughs> Do you have any advice for a novice YouTube content creator? Oh my goodness, I don't think I've ever been asked this. I don't actually know. And that's because honestly, I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm just throwing content out there and hoping something sticks. And so because of that, I think probably the best advice I can give is try different styles of content because the YouTube algorithm changes faster than the weather. Like what was popular, five months ago, YouTube algorithm is now going, no, we're not gonna push this anymore. So try different things, see what works, and also remember to be fluid with it. You know, sometimes content is gonna not do very well, and that's just part and parcel of it. And it's important not to beat yourself up and just recognize that it's essentially just bundles of data. And you are just hoping that the YouTube system grabs some of it and spits it out on someone's lap. And sometimes that doesn't happen. <laughs> and so you just have to kind of take the good with the bad. I mean, sometimes I'll spend 50 hours, 50, 60 hours working on one video, maybe more. Sometimes I spend like full working days all day, every day for like two weeks on one video. And then YouTube just doesn't show it to anyone. <laughs> and it's heartbreaking, but you just kind of have to remember that YouTube isn't like personally attacking you. Sometimes your content's gonna suck and sometimes your content's gonna do great. And you can't get, don't get fixated on the numbers because the minute you get fixated on the numbers, you lose passion for what it is that you're doing, which is like the worst feeling is when you, you're doing something and you're like, I hate this. <laughs> so don't let the numbers affect how you feel about that content. You know, if you like the content that you're doing, if you're passionate about what you're doing, then that's fine. That's good enough. You know, you don't need like, 
YouTube to make you feel better about it is basically what I'm trying to say here because YouTube can be sad at, at times like it keeps changing all of the stuff and then nothing works anymore and then you panic for a minute <laughs> it's stressful um, what is the most intense paranormal experience you've had while being on your path? Mine has been disembodied voices and growls, both creepy and exciting at the same time. I like your mindset. That's a good mindset to be in. Um, oh, I've had some bad experiences. The, probably the... Huh, it, it depends, because like we're talking paranormal, so I'm not going to include astral stuff. Because I'm going to consider astral stuff different because it's... I'm kind of participating in it. Do you know what I mean? Like, like when something paranormal happens, sometimes you're just minding your own business and it happens. Whereas if you're if you're on the astral plane, you are actively on the astral plane. You've put yourself in that place. You know, so I'm not going to count the astral plane. I'll do a full video on my experiences in the astral plane at a different time, probably. Um, weirdest paranormal, like worst paranormal, most intense, most intense paranormal experience. I've spoken about both of them before and I never like being repetitive on here. But I'm thinking it's probably between Halloween 2016 and Wales 2016. 2016 was just an intense year, man. I had some shit go down that year. So probably the most, one of the most memorable would be Wales. So let's go with that. So myself and another magical practitioner, we are walking around Wales, the Welsh countryside at about... It's got to be the early hours of the morning. It's probably between two and three. And something like that. It's really, really late. It's super quiet. And there's this one road that goes between the sea and a forest. And the forest is like, there's like stone wall, like 10 feet up that, that like is the mound. It like blocks the mound for the forest. We're walking down the street, just talking about random stuff. All of a sudden, I hear like a bell like a church bell kind of and it rings like once it's like just one ring of a bell and we both turned to each other and we I, I don't even know if we really said anything but it was just that moment of like you heard that right <laughs> yeah I heard that so we keep walking down this road and all of a sudden everything is spinning and I mean every like it's literally doing like circles and I'm freaking out because I hate being dizzy. Being dizzy is probably one of the worst feelings. And I think that there's something wrong with me. I'm thinking, what the hell is happening? I turn to my friend, who's also a magical practitioner, who at the time is far more well-versed in demons than I was at the time. And he he just said, he, he just tries to calm me down. He's like, no, don't worry. It's not just you. It's not just you. We just need to keep walking. Just keep walking so we're walking down this road and it's a steep road all the way down the side of the hill like all the way down to the beach and we're just walking and walking and walking and walking and then we get maybe like 50 meters down the hill and then all of a sudden we hear this bell again and then everything stops spinning it was the weirdest experience it tripped me out for days that did and we were, we were talking more about it afterwards and, and he was very much well versed in demon work. I was not at the time very well versed in demon work. And uh, he, he just says, yeah, territory, demon territory. I was like, what are you talking about? I've walked this road like a, a thousand times. And whatever had happened, um, essentially a spirit had ended up making the edge of the forest its territory. and. Some demons like to make territories. It, it's kind of, that, it's that kind of dominance over that space. And we had walked into a territory, the edge of the territory. And you can always tell, and it's not just demons, it's fairies do it as well. Usually with fairies, it's like the, the tinkling of a bell, like a little light bell. In my experience with demons, it's usually always like a loud church style bell, like almost like a gong kind of, that kind of noise. And then, we went back and checked the next day and it was gone completely clear it, it just disappeared overnight but i think if i'd have gone there by myself i would have thought that i was going absolutely nuts i would have thought that there was something wrong with me i'd have gone to the doctors i'd have seen what the hell had made me so dizzy but you could even see it as i'm turning to look at him and his eyes are like i don't know if you've ever seen anyone that's dizzy but their eyes are like doing this like back and forth because they're trying to 
stop themselves from being dizzy. His eyes are doing this. And it was only really then that I realized, hang on, okay, it's not, it's not just me. <laughs> it's not just me. And I've had other experiences since like that. And I'm much more um, accustomed to demon experiences now, let's put it that way. And uh, yeah, it's an interesting one. That really spooked me. And I genuinely, I that's one of those experiences where you have to be there. And not only you have to be there, but you have to have someone else experience it. Because if it was just me, I think I would have gone to the hospital <laughs> to make sure that I was fine. But it literally was, you hear the bell, it starts. You hear the bell again, it stops. Like nothing happened. So weird. So, so weird. Where was I? Do, 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 do. do you have any good book recommendations for working with elementals? Oh, it's not specifically about elementals. I'm trying to, I don't know if I've got the book. I keep loaning books to my mom and I really need to stop doing it because it means I don't have them. Practical, practical, practical. It's not called practical magic. It might be called practical magic. I don't think it is though. Practical witchcraft, practical. It's in my beginner witchcraft book video. I know it is. It, I'm, I'm sure it's in that video. And um, in that particular book, she talks about working and connecting with elemental spirits in her local area and actually shares examples of how these interactions took place for her, which is phenomenal because most of the time when you read a book about elementals, they're like, oh yeah, do this and do that and it might work. Whereas in this book, it's specifically written with first-hand accounts of the experiences of the author, which I really like. Practical, practical solid, is it called practical solitary magic? Is that what it's called? I, ah, someone else just said it, practical solitary magic. I think that's the book that it's in. I'm gonna have to double check, but that one's really good because it's a beginner witchcraft book and it does cover the topic of elementals in a way that I have not heard other books discuss it before, in a way that makes sense and resonates very much with um, with my experiences with elementals. I've read some books on elementals where they're talking about these imposing, almost godlike figures. And in my experience, it's never been like that for me. And I always felt like maybe something was... I, I was interacting with the wrong thing, maybe. But it was only when I read the Practical Solitary Magic book and I had this moment of, oh, oh everything makes sense now. Everything's, that's great. Um, so yeah, that one I really like. It's obviously not like all about elementals. So it might not be ideal. Um, I just froze. I literally just glitched in the matrix. Um, <laughs> but it could be useful if you want that kind of beginner introduction to it. Unfortunately though, there aren't that many good books on the subject. I'm gonna have to properly deep dive, but all the books specifically about it that I've read treat elementals almost like gods. And I have to say, I've never experienced it like that. And that's obviously a personal difference and it doesn't mean that everyone's gonna experience it the way that I have. But I have found that a lot of books do discuss them more like gods. And I, I suspect that may have something to do with the Wiccan view of elementals, of the quarter guardians, you know, the the watchtowers in effect. Um, I think a lot of people have quite a different perspective depending on whether they follow more of the Wiccan form of elementals or the spirit form of elementals. Maybe that's what it is. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that's what it is. Do you work with Claire's? So like, this is like Claire sentence, sentence, sentience. Wow. <laughs> Words, clairvoyance and the like. Um, I suppose I do, but I've never really thought of it that way. I've always seen things, heard things, smelled things, sensed things, but I never really thought that as really any kind of clairvoyance or clairaudience or anything like that. I've always just, classified it as being just a bit sensitive. <laughs> I'll be honest, I'm, I'm a little bit sensitive in every aspect of my life, to be honest, I'm a little wuss, but I've never really considered it to be any kind of Claire ability. 
I've just kind of classed it as being one and the same thing, just to different degrees in like different sections. I don't know. I've never really thought about it before. Interesting. Um, do you think that high magic as in Golden Dawn is compatible with witchcraft? Yes. I mean, it, it's based partially on witchcraft. Obviously not entirely on witchcraft. Golden Dawn has got a lot of influences, but it's little influenced by witchcraft. I think that they can work together quite well. Um, I think sometimes you might have some compatibility issues with certain styles of practice, but that goes with anything, to be fair. You can have compatibil compatibility issues with most other practices and witchcraft occasionally. So I think it's just a case of trial and error and seeing what works and seeing what doesn't and seeing what you can blend together and what can't. Because obviously, like, my interaction with the two would probably be different than your interaction than the two. So sometimes trial and error is in order just to figure out what works and what doesn't. Yay, tea leaf reading. Yep, I have it down here. I actually, I'm trying to keep everything safe. I've got a print, this print that I got. You can't see it because <laughs> it's wrapped up. It's going here. So I'm trying to keep it safe, but I have a teacup because, um, oh, that's going to make so much noise. I have a teacup on the floor next to me because um, it went in a, a previous box and I kidnapped one for myself. And I've been wanting one of these for so long. I currently just use like standard teacups, but the problem is, is that because all my mugs are like this color, they're like blue or charcoal, it's kind of hard to do readings in them because they're like not the right color to do readings with. <laughs> so I finally got myself a white cup and saucer to do tea leaf reading in. I'm so excited. <laughs> The Halloween Oracle deck is a great deck to use. I really like the Halloween Oracle. I don't know, where is it? That's a good point. Where did I put it? I swear, this is like every day. Ah, <laughs> you mean this one? Is it this one? That was very loud, I do apologize. I just realized I've actually put the deck in back to front. The lid is on the wrong way around. So the lid is this way around, but the back is this way around. I really need to fix it. You know, the one thing I really don't like about this deck, it's nitpicky, it's so nitpicky. The cards are just slightly too small. That, that infuriates me. Why couldn't, right? Why couldn't they just make the deck book the same size as the deck and then use a smaller box? That would have made so much more sense to me, but the cards are really beautiful. For anyone who hasn't seen this deck before, you have like, owl which is really nice. I'll try to pick out just some of my favorites that are really nice. What else have we got? We've got, um, oh, the veil. This one was on my um, Samhain altar. I love this card. I think they still smell a little bit like rosemary, which is what I use to cleanse my cards because I have it growing in the garden. Oh, this one's cute. This one's really cute. Kitty cat. It's a kitty. I love cats. I'm so annoyed that I'm allergic to them. It's just like anger inducing. And then you have like skeleton. These are really, really cute. I usually bring them out around like Halloween because they're just so pretty. Uh, other problem with them, slightly too big. I, I just, big cards, man. I get that they're like super pretty and decorative and all that, but I just, I really wish cards, I feel like cards just keep getting bigger. I don't know if anyone else has noticed that. Every time I get a new deck of cards, it feels like the, the card size just keeps getting bigger. And like, I'm pretty certain that card size to hand size is not like going up at the same rate. I'm pretty certain that people's hands aren't just growing. Um, <laughs> I mean, maybe they are like in the long term, but not between like October and November. Um, so I just, I just wish they'd make like littler cards, just like little ones. Any thoughts on Bruhera? Any interest in it? I mean, it's not my tradition, it's not my culture, it's not my background, so I'm not going to be interested in practicing it. I, I mean, I think it's a beautiful tradition and I think that it's wonderful that it's going on as strongly as it is. But other than that, I don't really have any intrinsic interest in it necessarily, not any more than I would what I'm already practicing, you know? 
Do we as witches need more protection than non-witches? I don't mean during spell work, but when we are just out and about. Are we more noticed by spirits in everyday life? I personally think yes. Now, I know some people say that the whole you've lit a candle and now you're a light in the dark is bullshit. But in my experience, everyone that I know that started practicing witchcraft has experienced the same thing. And that is that when you start practicing witchcraft, weird shit starts happening. <laughs> and I've always stood by it. I've always experienced it in my own practice that when you start practicing and you start opening up that doorway in your life, you become knowledgeable in that field a little bit more. And when you're able to notice the spirit world, the spirit world then starts to notice that you're looking at them. <laughs> and I found that it's a lot like turning a light on in the dark room. Like you suddenly become the most interesting thing in that space. Because a lot of the time spirits, spirits know that other people can't see them. They're going about their life knowing that no matter what they do, people aren't gonna pay attention to them. Because even if they knock something over, that person's gonna be like, oh my God, did you just see that chair move? Let's check the CCTV. Whereas all that spirit wants is for you to interact with them. And so as soon as you get someone who's looking into the spirit world, the spirit world starts looking back because it's noticed that you can see, interact, you want to interact and see, you know, whatever it might be. They start recognizing that, hang on, it's not just that I am like looking out, it's that you are looking back and then you start being noticed more and more and you start noticing more and more weird as hell stuff. <laughs> and, um, I do think that you do need protections because it's not all spirits are good and sometimes um, sometimes they're bad. And so I would say always protections. What if you notice spirits without ever practicing witchcraft? Yeah, I did. It, it still applies. Like it doesn't matter whether you practice witchcraft or not. If you are able to interact with spirits, I would recommend having protections because the same applies. It's just often that people who don't recognize spirits before and who start practicing witchcraft suddenly start noticing the weird stuff happening. So I'd say if you can interact with spirits in any capacity or if you're even questioning that it's always worth having protections just to make sure that you're staying safe um when is your next video for through the blackthorn arch it was tonight at six o'clock and i just realized i've not pushed through a single comment oops apologies for that so if you commented it will be up soon um, I found that especially on the the podcast, YouTube has just gone crazy right now. There are there are literally like ad bots everywhere. Like I post a video and the first like fifty comments on that video are just links, just ad links from bots. And I've got to the point, especially on the podcast channel, where I I I've had to just manually push through all the comments because it was getting to the point where I had more bot comments than I had actual comments. So apologies if your comment hasn't gone through on the podcast channel, it's because on the podcast channel, I'm having to force them all through <laughs> because I have to get rid of and ban all of the bot channels. Um, so yeah, the video is up now, I believe. It's also available on the podcast platform, Spotify, Anchor, Google, and it's about the headless horrors of the Tower of London. And then I filmed next week's episode before this, um, that's gonna be going up next Monday. Um, I was a bit delayed this week, oops. I kind of was a bit of a day behind. And then I still have to script the video that's the ninth episode. And then I think the 10th episode is just gonna be kind of a chatty episode. I think that's what the plan's gonna be. What are the laws on parenting and witchcraft? Uh, where I live, you can lose your kids. I think here, I mean, it's perfectly legal to practice witchcraft here. There's nothing against it. It's more a case of as long as you aren't putting children in harm's way under any circumstance um you can have whatever spiritual belief you like like freedom of religion is a thing here that i know not every country has access to which is a it, it's awful that you can lose your kids simply because you have a different religious or spiritual belief than what is considered acceptable like that's awful um but here as long as you aren't doing anything that's putting children in harm's way um, you can pretty much believe whatever you want as long as, you know, everyone's staying safe. At least as far as I'm aware. Um, I've been looking at witchcraft for a while, but my mental health isn't great. And I feel like this makes my energy pretty unstable and I'm afraid to mess something up. Do you have any advice? Um, 
not really advice necessarily just like um me too. <laughs> I'm not really uh, afraid to talk about my mental health because I feel like it helps people. My mental health is so screwed up, it's unbelievable. I have an anxiety disorder here, generalized anxiety disorder there, panic attack disorder, oh, let's just throw that in for some fun. Um, and I can still practice successful magical practice. And I think it's a case of, it's, it's learning um, some energetic control is really exceptionally useful. Just making sure that you have learned the skills because that way, no matter how you're feeling that day, as long as you are in control magically of your energy, your emotions can be wherever they need to be. You know what I mean? It's about having, it's finding that control in another area that can balance it out has been exceptionally useful to me. And obviously I am not the most knowledgeable person imaginable on this, but in my experience, I find that when I'm really struggling, I take a step back. But if I feel like I want to practice, I find that having that energy manipulation skill really well controlled is exceptionally useful because it allows me to really like manually override a little bit if I feel like something is going a little bit wonky. But I say probably the worst thing that you can do is fear messing something up because of it, because then you're more likely going to. Just really just accept that it's, no, no one's mind is going to be perfect and sometimes our minds betray us but ultimately we ha you know we, we can't just not do something and that's the thing with me is I stopped for so long because I felt like I couldn't I shouldn't do it and then I realized you know what I want to do it so I'm just going to do it and I'm just going to make sure that I have these other techniques under my belt that are going to be really helpful to me in the long run and I just haven't stopped since <laughs> What can a talisman do? I have a full video on the differences between talismans, amulets, and charms. So I'm not gonna go into it in this because I think that's like a 30 minute video in its own right. <laughs> Where's the poppet? The poppet is in the same place it has been for the last six months in a drawer in my apothecary cabinet. <laughs> I just don't have space for it at the minute, so I'm just noting down this um, this book that's been magic connecting. Yeah, the poppet is the is in the drawer um, as it has been for a long time. actually have that book do I have that book oh no I'll check um yeah the poppet's still in the drawer I just don't have the space for it it keeps falling over everything is just chaos around me like I can't even sit on the other half of this sofa because it's just full of books so I really need to do like a full overhaul and then I'll see if I can put the poppet somewhere but honestly he might end up staying in the drawer for a while because at the minute I don't have anywhere to put him what are your best what are the best books for witchcraft what aspect of witchcraft? Yeah, that's about as, it's the only answer I can give is with another question. Uh, because it's a bit like saying, what's the best book on physics? It's like, well, what, what aspect of physics? Because that's gonna, it, it just varies so dramatically between different practices. Um, so yeah, more specific would be super good because then I can try and give the best answer that I can. Is it possible that protection magic causes friends with questionable intentions to basically vanish from my radar? Oh yeah. Oh yeah, big style. Um, especially if it's a general protection. So if you haven't, say, targeted that protection. So protection workings, especially if they're just generic, they are going to push away anything that is going to negatively impact us and our energetic field. So if you have a friend that is not the nicest person or has maybe not the best intentions, you'll often find that they just start avoiding you. And although it might feel very um, 
sad and like you don't want to lose that friend ultimately the fact that your protection has worked so well to the fact that it's pushing them away it's probably going to be a good thing in the long run but it can definitely happen so if you start doing protection workings and you are suddenly realizing that all of your friends have disappeared I wouldn't start thinking shit what's wrong with me I'd start thinking shit what was wrong with them because <laughs> if if there's so much correlation and you can't think of any other reason why it might have happened you might find that they simply feel uncomfortable being around you because your protection working is messing with their energy which is then going to start pushing them away thanks for recommending traditional witchcraft a cornish book of ways it's such an underrated book it's so good isn't it it's so good i love that book i'm currently like three quarters of the way through rereading it and i mm, it's so good and I need to read the rest of Gemma Gary's books. I have a few that are stacked up that I've kind of part read. Like I need to finish Silent Silent of the Trees or is it Silent as the Trees? I'm not sure. One of the two. Silent as the Trees, I think. I need to finish that and then I need to read The Devil's Dozen. I'm not sure if that's Gemma Gary though. Is that someone else? No, it's Gemma Gary. So I need to read The Devil's Dozen because um, I, I think I've read it once but I cannot remember any of it. So I have a few lined up that I still need to read. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. Happy holidays to you too. Oh my goodness, name. Did, oh, did, um, Desideratum? Desideratum, is that right? Desideratum, I'm so sorry if it's not. Thank you so, so much. I really, really appreciate it. And I hope you have an amazing holiday season. Oh my God. Are you still planning on making course content? I mean, have I ever planned on doing course content? I think I might have blacked out during this conversation. I'm not sure. Um, for me, my big thing, I, I don't know, it's it's one of them where I don't like putting paywalls against content. You know what I mean? I, I don't like saying to someone, you don't have the money to earn this information because that's not fair. You know, that's why everything I do on YouTube, yes, there's ads on it, but you can skip the ads if you want to. I mean, I don't get paid if you skip the ads, so please watch the ads, But <laughs> but also like, the ads are not money coming out of your bank account, do you know what I mean? The ads are something that, it's it's maybe a little time consuming, but you don't lose anything financially by doing it. What I really don't wanna do is to say, hey, this course is this much money. If you can't afford that, then screw you, because that's not something I ever, ever want to do, because I don't think that knowledge should be put behind a paywall to make it exclusive to people with extra income, do you know what I mean? So. I don't know what to do because it's always that kind of balancing act of there's some topics that I would love to talk about that I can't talk about because either YouTube will immediately delete them, will immediately demonetize them, which you would think isn't a bad thing, but when YouTube demonetizes something, they don't push it out anymore. So basically what happens is you don't get notified about it in your subscription box and no one watches the video. Um, or it's content that I don't think is gonna be used correctly. So I keep being asked to uh, do the video on, do a video on batteries, how to make batteries. I wanna know how to make batteries. And the problem is, is that although like 90% of the people who would watch that video on batteries would maybe take what I say and take the warnings and then do something appropriate with it. I know from experience that there's about 10% of people who watch that video who will do something stupid. <laughs> and I don't like the potential of what could happen if someone uses a battery in a way that isn't appropriate. And those kind of topics would be great to do a course on, but then I don't want to put a paywall on it. So it's like, ah, <laughs> so like I could do it on Patreon, but then there's still a paywall, but it's not like a massive paywall, I guess. Like it's like a dollar. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'll have to see, but like there's some stuff that I would love to talk about that I know I can't talk about when, um, when it's on YouTube because YouTube just deletes. Like, it's so heartbreaking when something gets demonetized. I was so annoyed. I did a reaction video and YouTube immediately copyright struck it and demonetized it. And I just, I'd spent like a hundred hours editing and I was like, no, no, I'm not doing it. I'm not posting it. Cause if I post it, it's just, it's just giving in to the YouTube gods. And I don't want to do that. Right, where was I? <laughs> How 
how's the workshop coming along? Oh my god, will you have spellcasting videos up soon or a workshop tour? Oh, it's I don't think it's going to be soon. I'm so sad. So I started the workshop in, it was like the 5th of July. And it looks like, it looks like a bomb went off in that room. Um, it's nowhere near being finished. The worktop has arrived. Fantastic. We can now batten the wall, put the worktop in. Fantastic. I've got a few chairs that are going to, be used so I can actually, you know, work on the worktop. I'm then planning on getting a wall mounted camera mount, which will be fantastic if I can find one because then you can get like a proper camera angle instead of like seeing over my shoulder on a tripod, which will be great. Still need to get rid of the old work table, which is covered in stuff, it's covered in stuff. So we're gonna like, I think we're just gonna chop it up because it's huge and it's heavy and it's made of wood. So I think we're just gonna chop it, bring it downstairs, then I need to get rid of all of the stuff in the room, put another set of Ikea furniture up because it's currently in a box on the floor <laughs> and hasn't been put up. And then we've got to do the entire set of shelves down one set of wall that's gonna contain all of my herbs. But today my herb containers arrived so I can finally decant all of my herbs into their final home and put like all the fancy labels on it. And then the first thing is probably gonna be an, uh, a workshop tour because you know that in five minutes I will destroy this place. <laughs> like I have every other room in my house. Um, and then I can start doing proper videos again. So like, I mean, these are proper videos, but I mean like like more um, spell videos, divination videos, how-to videos, things like that. Cause like the, I really want to do the, the Julie enchantment video I've had on my list for like two years. And I'm, I can finally do it when I get the workshop done, which is so exciting. I'm trying to figure out where I was and failing, <laughs> failing miserably. Do you think that everyone has the ability to see spirits or is it an, in an inherent ability? Both. And I will explain that. So some people are just naturally able to see spirits. They don't need to do anything to see spirits. They can just see spirits. However, some people need to learn to see spirits. They need to train their psychic abilities to be able to recognize things outside of the physical. So it's kind of both. Um, some people may have the inherent ability and then lose it when they become an adult and then they have to relearn it again. Some people never have it to start off with and they have to learn it from scratch. So it really is kind of a both situation and it just gonna depend on who you are and how sensitive you are and also your experiences. You'll often find that if you were allowed to experience your kind of childhood, you're more likely to retain um, the ability to see spirits because you weren't forced to experience the adult world at a really young age. And it's, that's why children often are very good at sensing spirits because they, they have that kind of childlike wonder that is often snuffed out of adults when you shove us into the corporate world. <laughs> and then if you end up losing that ability, you then can redevelop it later on in life. So it's not like once it's gone, it's gone. It's more like once it's gone, you can learn to get it back again. And if you never had it to start off with, you can develop it. It's just gonna take time. And I don't actually think it takes any more time to relearn it versus learning it. It's just about having the time and the patience to put into it. Du, du, du. What is your definition of a demon? By demon, I'm not referring to like demons as they are written in the Bible. I'm referring to demons as in the category, like the classification of spirits. A bit like fairies fit into a classification of fairies. I'm referring to demons as in the classification of demons, not demons like is seen within the Bible. I hope that clarifies, <laughs> hopefully. Do you believe that everything has a masculine and a feminine polarity? No, not for me personally. I, I don't consider that. Um, yeah, not me. I mean, some people probably do. I personally don't. I heard you mention a podcast. You have a podcast. I do have a podcast. The links are in the description box. It's called Through the Blackthorn Arch. You can find it on YouTube, Spotify, Anchor, Google. I can't put it on Apple because Apple won't let me into my Apple account and I'm really annoyed about it. <laughs> Um, any podcast you recommend for Wicca? I don't really listen to any Wiccan podcasts. I've got no interest in it because I don't practice 
Wicca. Um, there's a few podcasts that I do listen to. Very few, though. One is... Uh, oh, my goodness. Witchcraft, witchcraft, the un- witchcraft unbeaten path. Oh, words. Witchcraft through, witchcraft down, witchcraft on. Wh- it's got the words witchcraft and unbeaten path in it. <laughs> and I'm not sure how those two sets of words go together. But I know that they do somewhere. It's one that I really like. That one's a really good one. Do witches have to learn to see spirits, always have visions, etc.? Oh, this is pretty much the same as the one before, but it goes a little bit further. So some people have the ability to see auras. You can train yourself to ease see auras. Some people have visions, other people don't. You can learn to undertake it. Some abilities are going to be harder to develop than others. So for instance, visions usually have to be brought on by some form of trance work if you don't naturally have visions. But if you do naturally have visions, you may not need some form of trance work in order to achieve visions. So it's a really interesting one. And the answer is going to entirely depend on the specific ability that we're working on. So like auras are something that you can learn to see, but a lot more people naturally see them than learn to see them. Visions are something that you can do both ways, but how you do it is going to vary depending on whether you already have them or if you don't already have them. I'm trying to find information on trolls. Were they actually called trolls or only giants? My question is, what kind of mythology are we talking about here? (laughs) I'm going to need more clarification here because trolls are found in Celtic mythology and in British mythology and Welsh mythology and they're found in Europe and they're found in North America and they're found in Eastern Europe and they're found in the Scandinavian countries and the mythology around them is completely different. So in Britain... Trolls, giants are different things. In other regions, you might find that they're the same, but it's a case of are they referring to the same beings or are they just using the same name to refer to a different spirit than what another culture might have? So it's a difficult one because, for instance, in Scotland and in Wales and in Ireland and in England, we have the same spirits being called different things and some spirits have a name attached to them that in a different area of Britain is used to describe a different spirit. So when you're looking at information on a particular spirit like trolls or giants and the like, you're going to have to go um, location specific because I'd argue even in um, say Norway, Sweden, Denmark, you're going to find that even between, even in different areas you're going to find that the the mythology varies just as it does in Britain, just as it does in um, kind of like France, Germany, Italy, Spain. You're going to find that it varies. Same with North America. You're going to find that the mythology varies depending on the area in which you're in because the people who reside and resided in that area are going to have varying beliefs, traditions and the like. So it's very much a case of you can't go generic when you're looking at spirits. Um, you're going to have to go focused in. Let's go see where I was. Oh, thank you so much, Iz. I just noticed you said that. Thank you so much. My voice just went so freaking high. Oh, my goodness. Duh. Is there any rule about how old someone has to be to start practicing witchcraft? No, 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 not at all, not at all. No chance. There are people who find witchcraft really, really young and then they end up not practicing it for the rest of their lives. There are people who find it really young and then do practice it for the rest of their lives. There are people who haven't even considered witchcraft and then when they're in, you know, their 50s, their 60s, their 70s, they suddenly find witchcraft and they realize it's something that they're really interested in and they want to progress it and pursue it more. No age limit whatsoever on witchcraft. You can be really young, you can be more mature, you can be somewhere in between. It really doesn't matter. It's all just about your willingness to to learn and to practice and just kind of progress. How can I learn to consciously do astral projection? Okay, there's a video coming out next Wednesday that is all about astral projection and dreaming 
And you might find that you're already astral projecting, but you don't even realize you're doing it because you're confusing it with dreams. <laughs> so that video could be useful for you to watch if you are interested in the difference between the two and where, how to identify which one you're experiencing. When it comes to astral projection, it's, it's gonna depend on how experienced you already are. I would say that more likely than not, you would, to, when you start astral projecting, you would be doing it during sleep. It's much harder to astral project when you're awake. It's always possible. And a lot of people do astral project when they are awake, but obviously you have the distractions of day-to-day -day life. So a lot of people, when they first start, they start astral projecting during sleep. And often, especially when you're starting building up your psychic abilities, you're probably not even gonna notice that you've done it. You're probably just gonna think it was a really, really stinking weird dream. So start noting down information in dream diaries, note down everything that you experience. And slowly but surely, you're gonna start building up your psychic abilities through dream recollection, as well as through um, understanding dreams and recognizing them more, which can then help pinpoint how to drop into a, an astral projection state and then you can take it from there. It's a really difficult one because how everyone starts astral projecting is going to be very different. But in my experience, most people I've spoken to who start astral projecting start doing it during sleep before they start progressing onto doing it when they're awake. So monitoring your dreams can be really good to start gaining the, the psychic abilities to kind of recognize the differences. <laughs> Oh yes, I'm um, sorry, I forgot to read the question. I don't have ads because I have YouTube Premium. Do you still get paid? I do. So YouTube Premium still, it pays content creators for views even though you don't watch ads. So it still works either which way. Um, I think the only way that it doesn't work is if you have like an ad blocker that's not YouTube, then it doesn't work obviously. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about your experience with runes, pros and cons? I don't, I don't really have a huge number of cons when it comes to runes. I, I started reading runes when I was really young. It was the first active divination that I did. So I didn't start with tarot reading. I didn't start with pendulums, nothing like that. I went straight into rune reading and I didn't even know what they were. I just saw a set of runes, they're obsidian little tiny, I mean tiny, tiny obsidian runes because I couldn't afford anything more than that. And they're so beautiful. I still have them. They're in one of the chests in my living room. And um, I just started reading them and the best readings I ever did. I still love those runes. I still love rune reading. I got such accurate results every single time. And that's the thing is, I, for me, there aren't really that many cons because I always get really, really good readings from them but then it's gonna depend on what you feel drawn to. I was just always good at rune reading. I'm just, it's just the thing that I've always been particularly good at was rune reading. Whereas if you maybe really struggle with rune reading, you might find that ultimately another technique is gonna be better for you. Um, so for me, no real cons besides the fact that my runes are tiny and they are obsidian, which means they're made of glass. So, at any moment, I could accidentally knock a rune onto the floor and it will shatter into a million tiny pieces, which is a terrifying thought because they are one of my favorite things in my magical collection because of how just important they are to me. And that would be absolutely awful. <laughs> finally caught a live stream yeah it's one of those things like ships passing in the night i always end up uh, missing a few people i get i get one or two people who come on right at the end and they go yeah you're live stream and i'm like bye guys <laughs> Oh yeah, Tread in the Mill is a really good video. Not video, book. I have Tread in the Mill. Do I have Tread in the Mill? Yeah, it's right there, Tread in the Mill. It's a really good book, that one. I like a lot of the ones in that style though. I'm noticing like most of my favorite books are in that, that very down to earth style. I find some of my least favorite books are the very arty farty, mightier than thou. Oh, 
I'm spiritually open to the world around me. You know, we all know those books. You know those books that that literally make you feel like you belong in a different world. Like those books where you're like, this person cannot be living in the same world I'm living in. I can never sit through those books because I really struggle to connect with what the author's trying to share with me. Like, they're very like airy. I don't know what it is. I'm not very good with air element stuff. And that's one of my flaws is I'm good with water. I'm great with fire. I'm good with earth, air. I'm not so good with it. So when, when I encounter an author that's very airy in their attitude, if, if you work with the elements a lot, I hope you know what I'm getting at here. They're very airy with their attitude when they're writing. I just can't do it. I can't, I can't understand it. I can't do it. And I think, and so I really like the more like, um, rustic, earthy kind of books like Treading the Mill, just because I find, I find that style just a lot easier um, than I, I do airy books. Do you have a video on runes? Not yet. I'm waiting for my worktop to go in and then I, I'm hoping that you'll be able to see my runes. I have three sets of runes, so I'm hoping one of them is going to show up. Um, so that I can I can show you some rune reading styles and, and techniques and, and the like. Um, but I have a... The obsidian runes are not going to show up. They're all so stupidly tiny. I have a set of ceramic runes that are this colour. Which I, I also don't think are going to show up on a black worktop. And then I have a set of epidote runes. So I might end up using the epidote runes because I think that they will show up because they're green um, on the background, hopefully. Fingers crossed. And then I will, um, I'll, I will be doing some readings on that. Um, I'll have, I, did, have I never mentioned treading the mill in my beginner witchcraft books? Maybe I didn't. Well, I'll, when I come to do the traditional witchcraft book video, um, treading the mill will be in that with like my full review. Um, but without my tablet with all of my review <laughs> information on it, off the top of my head, cannot entirely remember it. That's not because it's a bad book. That's just because I often don't remember which book information comes from. So like, I, if people ask me a question, I can give them an answer. But if they ask me what book it comes from, I'm like, um, I don't remember. Because I tend to, I store the information, but I don't, I don't store the name of the book in association with the information. So I'm, I'm planning on doing that video in the new year. I have like three more books, maybe four more traditional witchcraft books that I want to read before I do that video, and then any others I will put in a part two. But for whatever reason, I always find that part two videos on YouTube do like really badly. <laughs> like really, really badly. So I feel like I need to find a different name to call part two so that it doesn't just get lost in the algorithm. But I will be doing a traditional butch, a traditional butchcraft, not what I was after, witchcraft book video. Um, that goes through like some of my favorites of the ones that I've read But I think we all know some of them are going to be really up there like a deed without a name traditional witchcraft A Cornish book of ways is going to really be up there because I love those books I live in South England not sure if that's relevant wait is this in relation I'm gonna have to check is this in relation to the Giants? Wait, or is that demons? Wait, I'm I'm just I'm just checking. I forget names. Let me see. I lose so much in the chat, that's my problem. Oh, I'm trying to find the message. I'm gone. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I can't find it. Is this in relation to the giants and the trolls, or is this in relation to the demons. I can't find it. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. I cannot find the message. I'll have to get back to that one. I'll have to get back to that one. <laughs> I think I was about here. I think I'm here. How do you learn to see spirits? I can hear and sense their energy, but I can't see them. That might be the way it simply is. Now, it's not the nicest thing to hear, but you'll often find that some people have more of an affinity with one than the other. So for me, I typically, smell is a really big thing. Like before I got COVID, I was like a bloodhound, but now I, 
my sense of smell is like dead compared to what it used to be like. I'm hoping it comes back again. But I can usually smell when a spirit is around because there's something that changes. It's that perfume, it's the cologne, it's the, it's the smell. So it's the, it's the sickly sweet sugar water smell of fairies or it's the sulfurous stink of some demons or it's the, the, the familiar perfume of someone that I used to know or it's the cologne of a man that's passing through. So for me, fragrance is like a really big thing and then it's sight. Um, for instance, there's a cat, I'm pretty certain it's a cat that, that I used to pet outside and I'm pretty certain that, that he has passed away. I'm not sure how, but I have not seen him in weeks. And then all of a sudden, when I'm walking through my kitchen, I see a black and white shadow, like this far off the ground, following me. And he used to do that all the time. Every t everywhere you walked, he would follow you, everywhere. And he wasn't my cat, he was one of the neighbor's cats. And I still see that. However, I don't hear spirits as much as I see and smell them. Whereas other people will see spirits, but they will never smell anything. And other people might hear spirits, but they might never see anything. And I've noticed that some people are just wired one way or the other a little bit. Like you can obviously force train it. So it's about, it's about paying attention. So if, if you can sense something, pay attention visually to what's different, if anything is. Or if you can see something, listen and see if anything is different. Because when it comes to building spiritual and psychic abilities, I've noticed that acknowledgement is really part of the, the entire thing. The more you acknowledge it, the more your brain knows to pay attention to it. So it becomes easier and easier to acknowledge it until ultimately you don't need to acknowledge it because your brain's already done it for you. So I found that if you can already sense one thing, then see if you can see anything that's different. So if you've heard something and you can sense something and you can tell kind of where they are, look at them, pay attention to, to what's there and see if you can notice any differences. Trying to figure out where I am. Trolls in Norse paganism. So, so in which case, if you're after a particular thing like Norse paganism, I would then look at the particular mythology in that area. Because trolls in, say, Scotland are a very different thing than trolls are in um, Norse mythology and in Norse belief systems. And you may find that what we call a giant in one area of the world is called a troll in another. Or they might be distinct beings, but I have not studied Norse mythology enough to be able to give you the answer on that one. So if anyone has any book recommendations for Norse, my Norse mythology that might be able to help with folklore and spirits, please do so because that would be very, very interesting. And I actually might search the answer up for that myself because the differences are so extreme within just the British Isles that I'm gonna be really curious to see if the same very extreme differences vary between um, other countries and in other areas. I think that would be really cool. <laughs> Books on herbs and uses. I have a full video on the green witchcraft books that I recommend, which include my recommendations for herbal correspondences. That being said, there are lots and lots of books out there and it's worth looking for a book that's been written by an author in your local area because some books are written from Australia, which contain primarily Australian herbs, whereas other books are written in America, which contain mainly North American herbs. So I would say if you're looking for a book that's gonna be really useful for your area, try and find an author of the book that's in your area, because that way you're gonna have a better understanding of the herbs that are grown locally instead of only understanding herbs that are grown in another country. And the books that I have are a little outdated, I could, I could say that they're a little outdated, but because I've added in a lot of my own correspondences, I can kind of top up the missing information. But if you're looking for something specific, I would go for a book that's written by an author that's in your at least continent, 
let's go with that, at least continent, um, because at least then you're going to have some of the suitable herbs that are going to match what is available in your area. Oh no, it's gonna jump. Oh no. You won't be allergic to ghost cats. Exactly. I won't be allergic to ghost cats. This is amazing. Can curses carry through generations? In some extreme cases, they can. However, a lot of people claim that they've got generational curses. Usually they don't. There's this big thing going around Instagram noticing recently of like posts of people being like, we are the ones that are breaking generational curses. And like dozens, like dozens of people that I know share it. And I'm like, how many general generational curses do you think there are? Like in some cases, yes, there can be generational curses. But can you imagine how much power it would take to put a generational curse on every single person in that family's bloodline? It takes a huge amount of energy to even put a curse on one person that's long lasting, to then do it to every single person and then every single other person in the bloodline. That is a lot of energy. And I think a lot of people seem to forget that it takes a lot of energy. So they, they can exist, but they definitely are not as um, long lasting and as easy to do as a lot of people think. Would you consider collaborating with other witchy YouTubers? I mean, I don't, I don't know. I am, um, I'm scared of people. I don't interact with people very often. I like keeping to myself. And I don't really know that many other witchy YouTubers. Like, I know Olivia from The Witch of Wonderlust, and I know Mystic Dylan, briefly. Like, we vaguely know each other on the internet. <laughs> but because I don't, I don't, I'm not really part of the witchcraft community, so to speak, like, I don't interact with a lot of people, I don't really know if anyone would do a collaboration with me, or how that would even work, because there's not that many British witchcraft YouTubers. There's mostly American witchcraft YouTubers, I've noticed. So, who knows, maybe one day. Maybe one day. Can a family curse allow us to see spirits more often? Um, why would it need to? I suppose that's the question. Why would it need to? Like, a pur the purpose of a curse is to be harmful. And I can't really see what harm it would be. I mean, maybe this is because I've never had like a really, really bad spirit encounter, maybe. I can't think of much reason why a generational curse would need to have you see spirits more. Usually they um, curses are more into destroying your life than giving you psychic abilities. So I don't know, I think it depends very much on the um, intention of the working, I'd say it's not really all that likely unless there's some specific purpose um, to allowing you to see spirits. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Ooh, I want to work with the planets, but I'm a little nervous. How do I go about learning more about how to work with, say, Jupiter? Look into planetary magic as a whole is really, really useful. Um, the book I'm reading at the moment, that Liber Sigillum, is focused primarily on um, alchemical, ceremonial style planetary magic. Um, the Lords Who Wander being the planets. Um, that's really, really interesting. I will say it's intense, like it's a lot. If you are not used to the language of a book like that, it's going to be a lot. <laughs> um, so that's a good one. And then I have this one, just pulling a random book off a pile. This one is The Planet, the Magical Philosophy Book 4, Planetary Magic by Denning and Phillips. This one. Um, I'm not all the way through this one, but this one also touches on a bit more of a ceremonial style 
um, planetary magic book. However, that being said, obviously, if ceremonial magic isn't for you, then the way you're going to be approaching planetary magic is going to be different. So it's going to depend on the style of magic that you're going for. Um, if you're going for ceremonial magic, then this one is good so far. I haven't read all of it. And then Libra Sigillum is really good so far. I also haven't read all of it. I need to finish it. If you want something that's a little bit less ceremonial, it's then a case of tapping into the energy of that planet rather than kind of evoking the planetary body in a ceremonial way. You, it's more like tapping into planetary energy as you would tap into lunar or solar energy. Whereas when it comes to um, ceremonial style planetary magic, there's a lot more ritual that goes behind it, the correct sigils, the correct oils, the correct, the correct seals, um, suitable um, met metals, suitable times, days, even down to hours. Um, planetary hours can be exceptionally important. So it's it really depends on the style. One of them is a lot more organic, I suppose, and that is working with it as you would work with the sun or the moon in a standard kind of eclectic witchcraft way. The other is the rather intense planetary magic you find in ceremonial magic, uh, which is... Um, a lot. <laughs> Planetary ceremonial magic is a lot and it's actually a main focus in a lot of ceremonial magic. So if you're interested in planetary magic, you might find that ceremonial magic could be really good because they do focus on planetary magic a lot. Is it okay if you have no interest in herbs and crystals? I want to use mostly toys and art supplies. Oh yeah, completely. You don't need herbs, you don't need crystals, you don't need anything. Genuinely, when it comes to successful magical practice, it's more about the energy and the intention that you're putting in to whatever working it is that you're doing. That could be something exceptionally artistic. It could be creating things from clay or painting it on canvas. It's more about the energy and the intention that you add into it and not the things that you're using. So stones, herbs can be exceptionally useful to add extra association into that working, but it definitely isn't going to be um, a replacement for the energy that you need to be putting into it. So you definitely don't need crystals. Definitely. You don't need herbs. They can be really useful, but if it's not something you're drawn to, you don't feel, don't feel the need to get them because you really don't need them. Is carving the planetary symbol onto a candle and drawing their symbol on sigils enough to evoke the planet? Uh, no. I'm going to go with no, mainly because mm, it depends. What are you referring to evoke? Because it's one thing to add like a small amount of the, the association into that working, but full on planetary evocation is like a full ritual in itself. Um, evocation being the... Uh, I'm trying to find a bit, the best way to describe it. Within within ceremonial magic, it's often seen as almost a a physical containment of a large supply of planetary power outside of the body. Is what I would probably describe planetary evocation as being, to me and my understanding of planetary ceremonial magic. Whereas other people maybe wouldn't consider evoking to be that so much power. So. I might need a little bit of clarity on that one. It can definitely be helpful to add that association into workings. It can definitely be helpful in adding a portion of that energy into your space. If you're wanting to work with planets, I would also recommend connecting with certain planetary hours because they can be super powerful when working with planetary energies, even if you don't go the ceremonial route. Whether that is going to... I, I don't personally consider that to be an evocation unless it comes with the the summoning aspect of the evocation when it comes to planetary magic. But then I think that really depends on definitions. Because <laughs> obviously it's going to be different depending on uh, which side of planetary magic you're going to be to be looking at. Um, how do you read witchy books? Do you sit down in bed or at a desk and take notes? I 
have an app that I use and I sit down in my living room and I will just read. And every time I come across something I like or hate, I will note it down with a plus or negative sign next to it. And I will just chip away at the books slowly but surely, noting down everything that I like and don't like about it. Now, it's important to remember here that obviously when I'm reading witchcraft books, I like keeping note of what I like and what I didn't like in each book because I do talk specifically about individual books. I think if you are going to be learning from books in just a, a casual way, you definitely don't need to be like keeping note of like the page for something that you didn't like or anything like that. It's worth just taking note of the information that you think is useful, that you are going to want to look back on again, but maybe you will forget where it is. It's good to take note of it. But if you, if you physically own a book, you don't need to be writing down every bit of useful information that you found in that book because you own that book in your collection. You can find that information again written by the author instead of like copying it down into your book of shadows. So I'd say just keep a note of the pages, whether that's with post-it notes. Some of my books have got like post-it notes stuck out the top of them with like a name of like what the chapter was about. So that then if I really want to find it again, I can go to the post note and I can find it instead of wasting my time writing it for 10 hours in my book of shadows. But then I still own the book. I mean, I think it's different if say you're taking a book from a library, but if you own the book, don't feel the need to like make a million notes on the topic if you have the book. Just note down like, this page is useful <laughs> and why. This page is useful and why? Because then it stops you writing stuff down for hours on end. Could you talk about how magic is perceived among the British? In my country, in Mexico, people look down on witches and they are regarded as ignorant. In England, obviously I can't speak for um, Scotland, Ireland, even Southern Wales, because I don't really have that much experience there. Um, you are looked down, you are looked at as being clue, clueless idiot. <laughs> um, it's not considered a normal part of British life, of English life. And so you are often looked at as someone who is living in a fantasy world, who has no idea what the real world is like and hides away behind magic and witchcraft and cauldrons. Whereas a lot of the time it's actually the general public that doesn't understand what witchcraft is and not the other way around. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, it's not an accepted part in, um, British, like English day-to-day um, -day life, which is why a lot of people don't like talking about it, like to colleagues or like they don't want their boss finding out about it because you definitely have this association with it that if you believe in magic, you are not capable of doing a job in some cases, which I think is really, really unfair. What would you consider your most innate skills and what have you learned that actually cost you a lot of work to get the hang of? Oh, interesting. So, uh, it's a difficult one actually, because like spirits, I've always been able to see and interact with spirits. That's one thing. Um, astral projection I was doing when I was a child. Uh, lucid dreaming I was doing when I was a child. But the one thing I really, really struggle with is learning formal divination. For whatever reason, I've always struggled so much with it. And also relearning astral projection, that has been a, a trek and a half because I, I, I stopped myself from, from learning, like from doing it because it scared me when I was a child and I just didn't wanna do it anymore. So I just didn't do it anymore. And then once you forget how you did it, you then have to relearn it again, which is really time consuming. But the worst bit for me was trying to learn to read tarot cards. Like now tarot reading is fine. However, I was trying to do it for like 10 years and failing miserably. And I would get like a different deck. I was like, it's gotta be the deck. It's gotta be the deck. I'll try this one instead. Oh, I'll try this one. Oh, I'll try that one instead. I'll switch books. I'll, I'll try this instead. And in the end, I realized it was just because I was relying on memorizing the meaning of the cards, which I have short and long-term memory loss, which makes memorizing anything basically useless. <laughs> like I remember a lot of like random information, which is why I can do these live streams because I remember a lot of just like random stuff because that's the stuff I really enjoy. But if it's something that like, I'm trying to force myself to remember, my brain will just yeet it out of existence. So I was trying to, memorize tarot card meanings for a very 
very long time. And I got to the point where I just, I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it. I, I would see a card, I'd read the meaning in a book, and then I'd pull the same card two days later and I would have forgotten the meaning. And I beat myself up over it for so, so long. And now I don't even bother with it anymore. Now I look at the illustrations and I know what the card means because I've started to open up my psychic abilities again that I pushed away for so, so long. And then that kind of leads into the astral projection thing where I really had to kind of force start it again because I pushed it away for so long. It made every psychic aspect of my life really difficult because I'd kind of shutted it into this box and it took me so long to open the box again and to actually brave like going inside. So uh, yeah, that's probably the hardest thing. Cause like some stuff it came with, like the spirit stuff is fine. Like I've, that's always been good. But for whatever reason, everything else that was like um, psychic based, I just, I just shut it all off. So now I can read tarot cards, fine. But as soon as I have to remember the meaning of a card from a textbook, I can't do it. I'm absolutely done for, I can't do it. It's like with runes. If you stick a, a rune book in front of me, I have no idea how to memorize any of it. I've tried, I've tried memorizing rune meanings and I have failed every single time. The only way that I can do divination, like under any circumstance, is to just do it based on intuition. I can't do it based on meanings because my memory is just that bad. Like it really is just completely awful. Or they assume you're Wiccan. Oh, that's really true. That's in relation to um, how like British people perceive witchcraft. I have had that so many times of of people being like, oh, Wiccan. I'm like, nope. They're like, what are you talking about? You said you practice witchcraft. I'm like, yeah, witchcraft. I didn't say I was Wiccan. They're like, same thing. I'm like, no, it's not. And they're like, yes, it is. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that, that's the other one, especially because obviously Wicca is, Wicca started in England. Um, it's ended up becoming kind of synonymous with witchcraft. So if you say witchcraft, they hear Wicca every time. like. It, it kind of goes one way or the other. Either you talk about witchcraft and they look at you like you're absolutely bananas. Or you say witchcraft and they go, oh, Wicca, I've heard of that. And then you've got to spend 20 minutes telling them that Wicca and witchcraft are not the same thing. And by the end of the conversation, you know that they don't care. <laughs> and you may as well just give up because they really don't care. <laughs> Where did this come from? I ended up with like classical music in my head. What just happened? How do you feel about Christmas? I, I'd love to celebrate Yule more, but it can be sad when you're the only person you know interested in paganism. How can you celebrate by yourself and stay upbeat? Well, I don't really care about other people. So I just celebrate by myself. <laughs> and this is the problem. Cause like, I, I really struggle to, um, to kind of under, not understand, but to be able to know what to say in this circumstance, because honestly, I would rather celebrate it by myself because I like being by myself. <laughs> I've, I've done celebrations with groups and I often always find that they are never as good as you think they're going to be. And I think that, that maybe that's, that's the answer to all of this is that oftentimes when we celebrate alone, we always think of how good it would be to celebrate with other people. But then when we celebrate with other people, we realize it's actually not that good and we'd rather be at home doing this alone. Cause like I've celebrated Sabbaths with people and I'm very grateful to have had the ability to do that. But you often find that some people are more, how do I describe it? Some people are very clicky and you'll often find that you don't have the same interactions that everyone else is having. 
You often find that people stick to their own groups, that they don't involve you. You'll often find that some people use it as just a celebration to get drunk while other people want to do workings. And honestly, by the end of it, you just kind of want to go home because you're cold, <laughs> especially for the, for the winter solstice. So like, um, it's interesting that, I don't know, for me, I, I don't really want to, I don't really want to celebrate with other people because I've done it. So like, I just celebrate it by myself. And I just acknowledge the fact that at least if you celebrate it by yourself, you can kind of just, you can take it all in. Whereas I think with other people, you aren't. Wicca, Wicca and witchcraft, Wiccan and witchcraft are protected under the Freedom of Religions Act. Is it not the same in the UK? I don't actually know if it's the same. I know that in 1952, two, three, two, I think it's 1952, they repealed the Witchcraft Act, which made it illegal to practice witchcraft. Um, so technically it's perfectly legal to practice witchcraft. And I'm pretty certain that you aren't allowed to discriminate against someone based on their religious beliefs. I think that's illegal in this country. So if you are Wiccan and your boss knows that you're Wiccan, they're technically not allowed to do anything because of your religion. But I think that doesn't necessarily stop some people from treating you differently because of it and finding other reasons why they might treat you differently. So it's one of them where it's quite difficult. Um, I'm gonna have to check that actually, because I really don't know. What's your favorite method for enhancing your abilities? For me, it's acknowledgement. And I say it a lot, I've, I've just finished editing um, the astral projection versus dreaming video, um, which is going up next week. And in that I say it like 120 times. Acknowledgement is exceptionally useful when it comes to all psychic abilities. Because the thing is, is a lot of people have psychic abilities, but they don't realize that they're psychic abilities. So they just pass them off as being something normal and mundane. You know, oh, it was a trick of the light. Oh, I've not slept enough. Oh, maybe I need new glasses. You know, you hear these things a lot from people. And I always find that if you dismiss it, um, then you end up pushing it away. Whereas if you acknowledge it, then you end up noticing things more. And I found that a lot, especially when I was interacting a lot with other magical practitioners, um, kind of in person rather than online, you would find that because they're also present, you feel the ability to acknowledge things more frequently. Because obviously when you're by yourself and something happens, you go, I'm just tired. But when three other people are with you and they go, did you just see that? You then realize, hang on, it can't be because I'm tired if other people saw it as well. So I find that being around other people is really useful because it gives us the ability to not dismiss everything as something mundane. You know, it can't be your glasses needing to be changed if other people have seen it as well. So I think acknowledgement is key and it's really easy to do when you're in a group of people. It's a lot harder to do when you're by yourself. So acknowledge things, start acknowledging things. Write in your dream journal, have a dream journal <laughs> so that you can write down everything and anything that you remember, literally anything and everything you remember, even just a color. What season was it? Where were you? Were you by yourself? Do you remember a smell? You know, what happened? Anything that you can remember, even the most minute detail helps us with dream recollection, which then helps us with lucid dreaming, which can then help us identify whether we are astral projecting or whether we are simply dreaming. If you see something out the corner of your eye, instead of going, oh, I'm just tired, go, I just saw that, okay. You've acknowledged it. Now your brain has acknowledged that it saw something. So when you see something again, you're more quick to acknowledge it. If you smell something different, acknowledge it. You can find a mundane reason for it if you want, but just make sure that you acknowledge it rather than instantly dismissing it. If you have done a tarot reading and in two days you start seeing the things that you read in the tarot reading, don't just go, oh, it's just a coincidence. Pay attention to it. For goodness sake, pay attention to it. I have this all the time. I get deja vu every single day, all the time. And I used to just go, oh, I'm just imagining things. But now I'm like, whoa, deja vu. And I'm realizing it's because I dream of it and then I partially forget the dream. And so when it happens, it's deja vu. 
And I don't remember where I've seen it before, but it was in a dream that I've partially forgotten. And by writing in dream journals, I now know that it's premonitions in dreams that then come true in real life. And by acknowledging things, it's way easier for our brains to pick up on it happening. And which is why children have a much easier time with psychic abilities than adults. Because as adults, we are trained to live in this mundane world. Everything is understood by science. Everything is done by the book. Pay attention to this, go to work, work nine to five, get married, have kids. We are programmed into this like way of thinking where everything needs to fit into this mundane, normal world. And this is not true everywhere in the world. There are many, many cultures around the world that have um, belief systems that are very different than what we have in the West. But in the West, it's boring as hell. We think that everything is normal and that we can't think of anything outside the box. But children, children aren't like that. Children have imaginary friends. Children talk to themselves and they play games and they interact with fairies and spirits and they have premonitions and they astral project because they aren't, they aren't restricted by the world that we put on adults. And so you'll often find that children have a much easier time with psychic abilities because they're able to acknowledge their experiences and their parents will go, oh, how's your imaginary friend today? Or like, oh, what did you talk about with your imaginary friend? And adults will play along with children. To a child, that imaginary friend may well be a spirit. It may well be a spirit. It could be an imaginary friend. But children are more willing to acknowledge these things if they're in a safe environment because their parents will, you know, go on with it and they're just children. It's fine. They're just children. But can you imagine if Dave from work walked up to you and, talk and started talking to you about his imaginary friend? You'd think he was bananas. Why? Because our world is messed up. The Western world is messed up. And so if you can even just acknowledge things in your own right, it's so helpful. And it's the one thing I would recommend to anyone, literally anyone. If you want to develop psychic abilities, acknowledge shit. And sorry, that, that went on for a while. Um, I'm very passionate about acknowledging things. Have you noticed that? I think it's just that so many people don't. Like, so many people want a quick route to having psychic abilities. And there is no quick route to having psychic abilities. Is there a better word, is word to call black magic? In a previous video, you said that magic has no color, true, and that the name has racist roots. It does, sadly. So typically I will, it depends on who I'm interacting with, right? So if I'm interacting with a complete beginner, which is what I typically do on YouTube because a lot of people who click on my videos are beginners, obviously not all. I will refer to it as positive and negative intention. So the energy is the same. It's the intention, the intended outcome that is different. One is for a positive intention. The other is for a negative intention. People always tell me off. They're like, oh, just use the word baneful. I'm like, yeah, but some people aren't English speaking and some people find the word baneful to be confusing. But then with other people, I, ref I will refer to it as positive and baneful. Some people will use the phrase light and dark. I also don't really like that because it still doesn't really fix the problem. So I typically, if I'm interacting with just the general public, I will use positive and negative because ultimately the energy is the same. It's the intended outcome that's different. And also then it avoids the problematic stereotypes that go with the two terms that I really just don't like. <laughs> How do you combat the fear that comes with seeing things others don't or not feeling like you are living in a delusion? Um, it's a difficult one because for me, I've always lived like this. So I don't see it as being different because for me, it's just normal. But also I've had the, the opportunity um, to have experiences with other people. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, the bonus of having experiences with other people is that you can't then think that you're crazy because other people have had the exact same experience at the exact same time and they can tell you exactly what they saw and it's exactly the same as what you saw. And so if you have the ability to join a witchcraft group, um, it, it can be a really good experience because you then start learning that 
you aren't the only one who's had that experience, other people have had it too. And then also just knowing that the world is not entirely what we perceive in the Western world. A great book, by the way, is A Deed Without a Name. A Deed Without a Name is a wonderful book because it truly discusses how, especially in the West, especially in Britain, our belief system over the centuries has changed considerably. We were once a community of people, a group of people who would perceive other aspects of life as being just as real as the physical waking life. Um, however, now you're seen as being a little bit missing, a little bit, a little bit not quite there, if you believe that you can have premonitions in your dreams or, or if you astral project. And it, it's a problem that the general population has is that they look down on people who perceive other aspects of the world as being as real as the physical. But you have to remember that that's, that's a cultural shift. That's a, that's a shift in the belief system of the people rather than a, a specific black or white, you know, right or wrong, zero or 100% kind of matter, you know? So it's not that one is right and one is wrong. It's just that a lot of people don't know how to understand it anymore. So after I read A Deed Without a Name, it really clicked a few things for me that weren't really clicked before. But generally speaking, I find that you just have to kind of go with it. Like the problem is, is that the minute you start going, um, you know, like, I don't feel like I'm living in the real world. I'm seeing things that others don't. As soon as you start shutting that down, you're going to lose it, which isn't worth it. It isn't worth it. Like the thing is, is conf conforming to society isn't always necessarily a great thing. Society, I think, as we all can recognize is a little bit messed up right now. Like it isn't, it isn't always the best right now. So I think it's just a case of, if you can be around other people, interact with other magical practitioners, hopefully that would help um, calm this concern that it's, it's different than what other people are seeing and experiencing because it, it's not. It's just that not everyone is perceiving things on the same level that you are. And if you can meet people that interact with things in the same way that you are, it really helps to cement things in that it isn't that you are seeing things wrong, it's that you are seeing things differently. I've been told that I have the ability to, this is an interesting one, I've been told that I have the ability to hear and see spirit, but I'm truly unable to figure out how to access it deliberately, although I'm smelling cigarette smoke at times when there shouldn't be any. I'm confused, okay. So you've been told by someone else, this isn't something that you figured out for yourself. I'm curious as to how this person would know what psychic abilities you have, if you don't even know how to access them. I'm really curious about that one. But as I mentioned earlier, it's all about acknowledgement. If you are smelling cigarette smoke that isn't there, acknowledge it. And then every time you notice a fragrance that is, isn't is meant to be there, acknowledge it. And slowly it will build up over time. But that one's an interesting one. <laughs> can, can you make a video of you humming like that or singing like that for an hour? I'd love to play it over in the background. Oh goodness, no. I could never do anything like that. Most of the time I don't even realise I'm doing it. I just fill in the blank spaces. Um, a little, My little folk witch heart loves the term blasting or owl blinking. I love the term blasting as well. I absolutely love it. I would use it more often if more people knew what it meant. <laughs> Sadly, when you, when you work on the internet, you have to just you have to work with the weakest link. Do you know what I mean? And I don't wanna isolate people by using terms like blasting and they're like, what are you talking about? I don't know what you mean. Whereas I, I tend to say negative magic just because at least then people can kind of understand what I'm saying, which is a shame because blasting is an epic term for it. I really like that term. Right, I think I am going to go now. It has been four hours. And I need to eat something. I am hungry. So I'm gonna go have some food. I'm not entirely sure what yet, but I'm sure I'll find something. Thank you so, so much for coming to the live stream tonight. Thank you so much to everyone who has liked and has subscribed and commented and donated in some cases. It really, really means a lot to me. I will usually work, do these live streams every single month. Usually the first 
Wednesday after the 15th of the month, which is, um, yeah, just a routine thing. So keep an eye out for the next one to come up. I usually put it up um, a day or two before I go live. And there will be another video next week. I'm thinking it might be astral projection versus dreaming. It could be unpopular opinions or it could be the spirit, the, the, the haunting video. I don't know which one you would prefer to see. I have them all. Let me know what you would prefer to see. And uh, I hope you all have a happy Yuletide. I hope that you all have a happy Christmas if you celebrate Christmas. I know that not everyone does, but if you do, then please enjoy it. And yeah, I will see you next week for another video or in a future live stream, perhaps. So yeah, four hours, four full hours. It doesn't feel like it's been that long, but my ass is completely numb. So I really need to go and sit somewhere more comfortable. So thank you so much. And I will see you in the next video. I can't keep saying bye for hours. I've done that before. I can't keep doing it, but yes. Bye. <laughs>